Hello, chat. Hello there. Good to see you today. Hell yeah. How's everyone doing? Everyone up to some fun shit? It's a good day when Gamozo is live. Hell yeah. We need some music? No, you just get silence. You get to sit there and be in your brain and think of all the happy thoughts. Paint those little happy trees, happy little neurons in your brain. Just painting them one by one. I'm doing great. I told you I'd come back for the next stream. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Good to see you back, Budgie. Hell yeah. Not music, Muzak. Oh. <sighs> Duh. <laughs> Shard and fresh shirt for us. Look, I, I try my best here. Nice view, dude. Thank you so much. It's a little, a little saturated, a little cloudy, a little foggy today. Uh, but as the... As it gets a little uh, darker out, hopefully it'll be more visible. All right. Oh, man. Got to figure out what music I want to listen to today. 142 cuties in chat already. God damn. Super, super fast viewers. Holy. What's your time zone? I'm in the PST. So it is currently uh, 1625. Or no, Sorry, 1525 right now. All right. Let's see. How's chat doing? I lost the initial chat log when I broke out the window. Apparently, it doesn't persist when you pop out the chat window. So I missed anything people said when I wasn't here. But should be good. Viewers go, Brr. yeah, it's fucking crazy, man. Bunch of people showing up to these streams these days. I, I, I don't get it. I didn't change anything except put my cute face here, so, you know, th things, things happen, I guess. Oh, man. Let's see, chat. Are you in the Pacific Northwest? Yes, I am. I can't hold, hold all of these cuties. Yup. That's why we're always on date night with the old candle, which you can't, you can't. I got, I trimmed the wick before lighting the candle today. So we got a we got a good flame going on that. It's nice and nice and saturated out on that white balance. All right. Um, it's 4:56 in the morning here. Oh my God, that's early. Woof. Or late, depending. Depending. Um, we came for the face. Aww. I even put my beard oil in. Trimming the wig. Yup. It, it made a huge difference. Now, I'm curious if this candle will get worse as the wax melts a bit and more of the wick is exposed. I'm not sure. Um, not going to lie, I have five candles in front of me now because that looks so pleasant. It's pretty nice. I got to say, I don't like the scent on this one as much as the other uh, wood smoke one, but we'll see. I, I actually uh, uh, need to get some firewood so I can get real fires running. It's 2326 GMT time. The Grand Mountain Time. I know that's not actually what it is. Um, <laughs> man, that candle smells nice. Yeah, let me let me waft the candle into the... I guess, I don't know why I think the microphone would be where you smell it, but there you go. There you go. You get some of that. Great stream, by the way. Thank you so much. We actually haven't really started yet, but I'm here to be entertaining. Are you a hacker or security manager? All those monitors uh, look super legit. Well, I can't manage, so I'm not a... Well... Just because I don't can't manage doesn't mean I don't manage, because there are a lot of bad managers out there. But no, I recognize some of my some of my flaws in management, so I uh, steer clear of, of that career path. Um, let's see. I need to buy some candles to use as a sensor for my Wii. What is that a thing? I'm not familiar with that. Well, it's 027 here. I will go to bed and catch a stream in the morning. See you around, local padre. Thank you so much for swinging by, at least for the first part. Well, I gotta go work, but I'll lurk in the stream. Sounds good. Uh, absolutely. Smell o vision. <laughs> Got the lurk lurk emojis. All right. Yes, two candles work as a sensor for a Wii? What? 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 It's, it just has enough IR? Wow! That's so cool! I never would have thought about that! So you just like, what, put them put next to your TV or something? <laughs> That's so interesting! You still need like the receiver thing? What? Can even spam two TV remotes. What the fuck? 
That's really interesting. What fuzzing frameworks do you usually use? I only use my own fuzzing frameworks. So I've got a bunch of emulators and hypervisors and debuggers and stuff that I use. So pretty much when I fuzz, I use all my own code. So in fact, I don't know if I've found Ode with someone else's code. That's not to say other people's code isn't good. It's just I, I typically like doing things on my own and having that level of control and knowledge and understanding of what's being done such that I can like basically go and fix things if they're broken rather than submitting a PR trying to figure out how someone else did it in the past. So co-author of Nick's here. Hey, Izzy Quiv. How are you doing, Cornelius? How are you? How are you enjoying your switch to industry? I know that you, uh, you work with one of my close friends now. The T Corn, the Tom Cornelius. Two Cornelius is there. I think you work for a different manager than he does, but you you both work uh, pretty pretty tangentially. I guess I don't know if it's Cornelius's or Cornelii, to be honest. Hi again. I prefer uh, you slash prefer Debian uh, for my everyday work in video editing to web dev. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I switched to Gen 2 recently, but I, I used Debian basically for everything before then. Repaste. Hi, I was wondering if you have any thoughts regarding Servo. It's a web engine coded in Rust. I am aware of Servo, uh, but I don't know much about it. To be honest, I think it's great that we're getting a web engine written in Rust, but I don't care too much about the web in general. So many, wow, many monitor, what do you use it for? To look cool and leet and be an expert hacker. Uh, but no, I have it, typically I have like a bunch of documentation open and a bunch of code open at the same time. So kind of having that mix is really nice. Um, I'm sad I can't watch today. I have to take a test too, uh, soon. Well, good luck on your test. Absolutely study up for that and go slay that test for sure. Um, how many instances of novel are in the paper? It's actually not 25. I do know how many instances there are. It is five, which is impressive. That, that already bumps the grade up. Now we do have a couple novel sightings. Um, we're gonna, we're gonna basically get our eyes peeled, get our glasses and binoculars out, and we're gonna be looking for those, those uses of novel. We're gonna see if it's actually novel. Um, but I think we'll find, uh, Basically, I'm going to be pretty critical of the paper as we read through it, but recognize that when I'm reading a paper, I'm typically talking about absolutes, but at the end of the paper, I typically talk about relatives. So when I'm reading the paper, I'm talking about how it compares to literally everything else, and then when I review a paper, I grade it based on basically uh, how much time they had, how much effort they had, their engineering bu budget, how many researchers they had on it, whether or not they're releasing source code, like all of those things factor in at the end. But as we read it, we're just going to kind of take everything at face value. And that's not 100% fair because if this mentions some way that it does coverage, if we compare that to another tool that only does coverage, it's not 100% a fair comparison because this does more than just coverage, but we're still going to like pull those things out and kind of look for those things. So I don't think we're going to be too crazy critical here, but yeah, that's a lot better than I expected. Yeah, how much of the writing did you do? I see that your second author, I don't know how much of the ordering of the authors matters, um, but I know that there's like some some relevance to the ordering there. Oops. All right. So I think we are basically ready to start. So um, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I know a lot of you have not seen the paper review format. Uh, a lot of the, like the new viewers who come by and watch more of the hacking Android stuff. We are going to do that after we read this paper. So we're going to start off reading the paper and then we're going to go and hack things together. Um, and then we might skim some sections depending on how long the paper is. I don't want to spend more than like two hours reading through this. Um, and depending on how many tangents we have, we might uh, speed thing through some sections and, and skip others. Um, but this is paper review. Basically, we pull up an academic paper. Today we have Nix, which is the gray box a uh, gray box hypervisor fuzzing using fast snapshots and affine types. Um, we do have a good sighting of affine there. That's a, that's a good word. Um, so already some good credit there. Definitely stands out from other papers. Um, 
but a nice pretty short title and I think it's pretty descriptive. So basically on paper review, we go through uh, papers and we read them and then we basically critique them for uh, what they claim is novel, what they claim is not novel, the things that they, uh, the way they display their data, the way they converse, the things that they're actually working on, how much bullshit or like how many things they're maybe lying about, like sometimes we're reading between the lines, but sometimes the claims are more bold than what seems like would be accomplished with an approach, so we kind of read through and we pick those things out. Um, so today we're going to be doing Nick's, um, and Nick's already, just a heads up, like, I think it's a good paper, um, so even though we're going to be critical of it, it's important to understand I think it's a good paper, we'll kind of grade it at the end and see how much we like it. Um, I think there's going to be some caveats to that of like how we grade it and some exceptions that we give the paper. Um, and we'll kind of talk about those as we go through it. So, hell yeah. All right. I'm from Germany. This, uh, the paper is from a German university. Uh, let's see how good it is. I mean, the Germans aren't no known for making reliable things. So if we're just going to be racist, I don't know. I've had a BMW. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, all right. Um, let's see here. Let me catch up on chat. I just bought my, I bought my first second monitor today. Uh, currently watching you on the new while chilling with Minecraft. Hell yeah. Hope you're enjoying that Minecraft. I have not played Minecraft since like 2012 or 2013, and I see it, and it definitely has made a lot more progress than I thought it would, so, I mean, of course, it's a, it's now a Microsoft product, which means it is nothing but the utmost quality, security, and entertainment value that you can find on the market. Um, <laughs> love my BMW, yeah, I had a 2003 BMW Z4, uh, 2.5i, um, that was the first car that I bought out of high school. I bought it because it was cheap used, and that was probably a mistake with the finances I had for repairs at the time. Um, but nevertheless, it was fun. Yeah, it leaked into the trunk immediately, which burnt out the amp and ruined most of the electronics of the car, but it still drove, and I just drove it without an amp or without radio for three, four years um, until I sold it. <laughs> All right. Is Nick's the thing uh, someone in chat told you they published as part of a PhD thesis? Uh, I don't know. People talk about their PhD, PhD thesi a lot, so I don't remember. Um, in Sweden, we talk about German quality when it comes to BMW. <sighs> I don't know. Merck, Kralin, BMW, don't at me. <laughs> it's a Microsoft product, so you have to fuzz it now. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Man, that would be fun. Just fuzz Minecraft, I guess. Thes the th 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 Thesauri. <laughs> Oof. I've got a 2001 E46 and I had a blast repairing that beast. Absolutely, yeah. I, I think it was fun to work on. I didn't do too many things to it. I uh, rewired like the third brake light when that broke. I... Obviously did like tires and brakes on it, and then I replaced the headlights, but I didn't do anything major to it. Um, so that car I've been pretty, pretty initial with. Gotta run, have fun, everyone. Great paper, absolutely. See you around, hombre. Cheers. Uh, so reading a paper and you can't run the code because they deleted it, yet Germans are reliable. I mean, it's totally fun. Like, I don't think they intended to have it open yet, so they probably had a link to it or something, or it was a private repo or... Something probably happened there. I don't know. I don't really care. I'm not too picky about that. To be honest, during a paper review, if you have the code accessible, that's probably just going to make it look worse because I'm going to judge it based on like the best code quality that can possibly be written and the best performance that's attainable. So I think we've seen in the past when we paper review things that have source, um, we typically go and see, you know, like six gigs allocated in a global... Um, bunch of out-of-bounds accesses, really shitty performance properties, unnecessary complications and tyings to architectures. So with the code not available, that actually just reduces the attack surface for the paper. So, 
Yeah, but yeah, Cornelius' stuff is pretty much always open source, so I'm not too worried about this becoming open source when the time is right or the polish is right. So, like, I immediately just off, off the tip of my head uh, just give some uh, freedom there because I suspect um, that that will be open sourced at some point. So, and I'm not too worried about it. And typically the code is usable, so I'm not too worried about that either. Could you give a quick description of what fuzzing is before we begin? I think I have like a bang fuzzing. Um, but ultimately fuzzing is uh, generating random inputs or corrupting or mutating or modifying inputs to a program to see how it behaves. So like if you wanted to fuzz Microsoft Word to try to look for bugs, you would maybe take your document file, your .x file, and then you'd randomly corrupt it or move text around or add images or remove images and then keep opening that file on repeat in Word to see if it ever crashes or behaves incorrectly or does something wrong. Uh, that's basically fuzzing in a nutshell. So obviously Obviously, it gets a lot more advanced than that, um, but that's kind of the high level. Review this if you want to uh, grow gray hair. I did read a little of XDC. I still am skeptical about PT for uh, kernel fuzzing uh, with dynamic loaded modules. I know that there are ways to make it work, but it's a, it's a, lot, of, a lot of pain. To be honest, I just don't like having to bring a decoder along to get coverage. I recognize it does have the best properties for performance, uh, but the... Uh, Code required is kind of a pain in the ass for that. Um, let's see. Uh, security, that was, uh, there was a major hack on Minecraft earlier this year. Problem with Authenticator that got a lot of accounts hacked. Oh, weird. Mine probably got hacked then because I haven't logged in for a long time. What is What OS is more secure, Linux or Windows? Uh, definitely Windows in that regard. Uh, Linux has very few mitigations out of the box. It has less code surface. Uh, compared to Windows, so Windows is typically going to be buggier and have more surface, but Windows has stricter mitigations. Obviously, you can run, uh, you can run Linux with packs, and at that point, you're basically, whoop, um, if you run Linux with packs, at that point, you're probably going to surpass the, uh, the, like, hardness of Windows, but Windows basically is uh, bleeding edge on its mitigations. And since Windows builds go out so frequently, um, those mitigations are turned on for the entire OS and all of the components uh, pretty damn quickly. So uh, Windows is very, very, very hard to land a bug in. Uh, Linux still uses like slab slub allocators in the kernel, uh, which are really easy to land like heap exploits out of. Uh, Windows has much much harder uh, like kernel mitigations, KSLR, uh, heap mitigations, heap cookies, uh, zeroing the stack to initialize it. There's just so many more mitigations on Windows that even if Linux has fewer bugs and less attack surface, it's typically harder to land on uh, Windows, especially since a lot of Linux bugs, since it is open source, a lot of those bugs end up getting fixed as not security bugs because there's so many eyes on the code, so many people working on it, that people come across bugs and fix them without really security background and don't know they should be treated as security bugs. So it's pretty easy to find a Linux bug that wasn't fixed as a security bug and thus it hasn't been backported. So anyone running Debian or Ubuntu or OSs that typically run a kernel that's a year or two old typically have a lot of problems there. So, yeah. Um, let's see. All right. Um, the result of some Google dude fuzzing Linux. Yes, this caller stuff. Absolutely, that's pretty good. That's it. I'm going back to Linux. Yes, yeah, some dude. Um... Can you tell Mr. Microsoft to fix the default Win 10 search? I tell them every every couple weeks. I basically rant about it all the time. It sucks. Uh, what are your thoughts on symbolic execution? Um, I think it's good, but I don't think it automates anything. Like, ultimately, to be effective in using symbolic execution to understand the constraints and the places where it does and doesn't work and building your environment to work with those things is a fuck ton harder than just auditing for bugs. So ultimately, if you have that skill set, it's a valuable tool to have, but it, it doesn't automatically find bugs. It doesn't make things easier for pretty much anyone other than people who write that symbolic execution tooling themselves. It's very, very, very difficult to use, and the performance of it is very bad, and thus you end up having to deal with trying to find things that are constrained, 
uh, in, in such a small way that you can still make progress or understand how to apply it incrementally or use it as part of a code review process or a fuzzing process. But right now, uh, symbolic execution is not the point and shoot that I think everyone kind of claims that it is. Um, the people who are effective with symbolic execution are specialized in symbolic execution. So. Uh, Windows 10 search is literally ass. Yeah, I don't understand how it's been that broken for that long. Um, it makes no sense. Need a monitors command? Yes, I do. Um, why do you have so many monitors? To have a bunch of code open and a bunch of documentation open at the same time. Are containers still a good, secu still a good security boundary with so many kernel exploits? Containers have never been a security boundary, and they never should be a secu security boundary. So no, absolutely not. Fuck containers. Terrible, terrible, terrible. It just directly exposes the kernel to, to foreign code. It is not at all a security boundary. Um, so no. Um, unless you mean virtual machines, in which case, yes, they, they definitely increase the difficulty, but it's still pretty easy to find a hypervisor escape in this day and age. But containers like Docker style, not at all a security boundary. No, 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 no. Common, common thing that people think, and it's entirely untrue. Um... Let's see, I need to re-implement the computer's command. Oh fuck, I was gonna do that before the stream and I forgot. Um, let's see. All right. Okay, so effectively, we're gonna hop into this paper review. Um, for everyone who wants to follow along, you can do exclamation point paper. And uh, effectively, you can do that um, to... Um, you can follow along if you want at home or go at a different speed. We're going to probably go relatively slow through here. Uh, we're going to probably do a lot of tangents and stuff. So, absolutely. So, we'll see, uh, we'll see what we have. All right. Everyone ready? Everyone ready for a little paper review? Let's go. Okay. Nix, the gray box hypervisor fuzzing using fast snapshots and affine types. So one of the things that I like to do, especially when the authors are here um, or will watch this video or whatever, is basically describe how I interpret things as I haven't read the paper. Um, so that way you kind of get a good feeling of whether or not the way you describe things is clear and makes sense. So just from that title, I recognize a gray box hypervisor fuzzing. So this tool is being used to fuzz hypervisor. So probably in an emulator or a nested virtualization. Um, it's gray box, meaning that you can fuzz things that you don't have source code to, and you can probably gather uh, code coverage with that. Uh, using fast snapshots, they probably just walk the page tables to check dirty bits. And then with and affine types, can't really say I know what that means. I would imagine that has to do something probably with their mutation strategy uh, and the way that they kind of organize the state machines of what they're fuzzing. Maybe something like that. Um, so we'll see. But yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll go with that. Um, we're going to go through the abstract and then I'm going to uh, catch up on... Um, on chat. Uh, we'll probably catch up on chat every like section or so. So if you want to ask your questions toward to when we're getting to the end of a section, you probably increase your visibility of your uh, question. So abstract, a hypervisor known as a virtual machine monitor, a VMM, enforces the security boundaries between different virtual machines running on the same physical machine. A malicious user who is able to run her own kernel on a cloud, I like the use of her there, by the way, um, her own kernel on, the cloud, uh, on a cloud VM can interact with a large variety of attack surfaces. I agree with that. Um, exploiting a software fault in any of these surfaces leads to uh, full access to all other VMs that are co-located on the same host. Hence, the efficient design, uh, the efficient detection um, of hypervisor vulnerabilities is crucial for the security of modern cloud infrastructure. Recent work showed that blind fuzzing is the most efficient approach to identify security issues in hypervisors, mainly due to an outstandingly high test throughput. Um, I would disagree with that. Um, maybe if you mean automated approaches, but by an absolute landslide, most exploited bugs 
regardless of surface, especially in the hypervisor, are just found with manual code review. Um, typically because fuzzers just find shallower bugs. Uh, they're not as complex. They're typically a little bit shittier in quality. They're usually like more shallow, which means they have a higher chance of getting fixed. So a lot of the complex interactions are often not found with fuzzers. Now that doesn't mean they can't be found with fuzzers, um, but traditionally I would say uh, that's still uh, sort of uh, code auditing. But I would read between the lines there that they're probably talking about automated tooling and scalable tooling, and obviously um, making more humans is a is a very long process to, to get them trained. Um, so that's not the most practical. Okay, so no complaints so far there. Everything seems pretty good. A uh, pretty long intro to something that I don't think is related to uh, the paper directly, like implemented in the paper, but it's a background of why this paper is important, so that sounds good. Um, in this paper, we present the design and implementation of Nix, a highly optimized coverage-guided hypervisor fuzzer. Okay, so immediately they said highly optimized, so that means I'm gonna come down with the biggest fucking hammer I can come down with, and we're gonna, we're gonna check that. We're gonna see if it's highly optimized or if it's optimized, because highly optimized opens up critique for, for basically being as good as it can be, um, and we'll see about that. I, I, I am gonna press X to doubt. Um, but I'm sure it's fast. Uh, we show how fast snapshot rest. Uh, we show how a fast uh, snapshot restoration mechanism um, uh, that allows us to reload the system under test thousands of times per second is key to performance. I'm glad other people have picked up on that now. I hope that's not mentioned as novel because I was doing that seven years ago. So I hope, I hope that's not novel here, um, but we'll, we'll be looking out for the novel word there. Um, furthermore, we introduce a novel mutation engine based on custom bytecode programs encoded as directed a acyclic graphs, DAGs, um, and affine types. Okay, so that is related to mutation, so I'm happy that I picked up on that from the title. Um, that enables the required flexibility to express complex interactions. Okay, so basically they're saying they have some graph that allows them to probably hold information about the state of the program under test and make inputs that uh, probably handle those states. Um, it's probably just fancy words for like what it actually does under the hood, but we'll see. Um, I don't doubt that it's a DAG, but but I think it's just probably like state machines. Um, our evaluation shows that while Nix has a lower throughput than the state-of-the-art hypervisor fuzzer, um, it performs a com uh, competitively on simple targets. Nix typically requires only a few minutes longer to achieve the same test coverage. Um, interesting. I don't know what that is comparing it to. I don't know if that is comparing it to chocolate milk. Chocolate milk doesn't really do anything, so I don't know if that is a fair comparison. Um, I don't know what hyper... I, I don't know if this is talking about a fuzzer, uh, fuzzer of hypervisors or a fuzzer that is implemented as a hypervisor, so I'm not sure. Um, okay, uh, Nix typically requires only a few minutes to achieve the same test coverage, so it's comparing kind of the new mutation strategies and all of that, which I typically don't care about, but it seems to be a big part of this paper, so we'll, we'll take a look at that. Um, on complex devices, however, our approach is able to significantly outperform existing works. Okay. Um, moreover, we are uh, able to uncover substantially more bugs. In total, we uncovered 44 new bugs with 22 CVEs requested. Um, I don't understand why there's a discrepancy there. I'm guessing there's 22 null DREFs in there. Um, but I, I hope... 44 doesn't include dupes of the 22 root causes, but I'm going to read that as 22. Um, our results demonstrate that coverage guidance is highly valuable, even if a blind fuzzer can be significantly faster. Yeah, no shit. Uh, coverage guidance is massive. Um, huge. So, and that's not an insult to the paper authors for putting that in there. The abstract is meant for a general audience, and thus it's totally acceptable to have wording like that, in my opinion. Okay, let me catch up on check. Um... Let's see. Um, also, tell me uh, when you were able to rub upgrade your RAM on your Mac. Oh, are people are people arguing about Mac versus uh, Windows or Mac books versus uh, Windows? Nice, very constructive chat. Um, let's see. Uh, it's novel and new because you didn't uh, fuzz hypervisors on the stream, um, so they didn't uh, do what you did on a hypervisor. So it's novel. That's fair. I'll, I'll give it that. 
Um, I'll stop harping on Max now. Yeah, I mean, it's just it's just hardware. It's it's just hard like it's the same. All that shit is the same. It's not it's not a fan club. It's two companies trying to compete to take your money. It's not a competition of which one is better. Like d don't don't fanboy against companies that don't give a shit about you because they don't care about you at all. Um all right. Do you write any papers? I do not. I I can't write. I mean, I can write blogs, but I can't write scientific paper style stuff. Um for 99% of people, it's just a portal to the web anyways. Yeah, absolutely. Cool people don't do academic papers? I mean, that's just objectively untrue. Um, <laughs> let's see. Hello, Metaconstruct. How are you doing? All right. Introduction. I always find it strange that there's an abstract as an, and an introduction, but I, I recognize that's just how things are done, so it makes sense. Um, introduction. As the digital landscape shifts more and more towards cloud computing... I mean, hasn't that been the case for like 10 years? Um, the security of hypervisors becomes increasingly vital for our society. Um, at the same time, hypervisors are complex pieces of software that deal with very low-level details of the underlying hardware. To properly understand the behavior of a hypervisor, both for security analysts and off-the-shelf analysis tools, we need a large amount of information on low-level hardware details. In combination with the fact that they are typically running in a highly privileged setting, this makes it difficult to properly test and analyze hypervisors for potential security bugs. Um, totally agree with that. No, nothing wrong there. Um, fuzzing has been studied as an effective way to uncover bugs in hypervisors. I'm not going to really look through all of your notes. Uh, yes, that's totally true. Um, the state-of-the-art methods are VDF and Hypercube. Uh, state-of-the-art open, state open source, but yes. Um, the former is based on isolating individual QEMU device drivers into harnesses that can be fuzzed by AFL, which makes no sense for fuzzing a device, in my opinion. Um, while, the, uh, while the latter does not use any coverage feedback, um, but is a blind fuzzer. And that, yep, totally true. Surprisingly, Hypercube still outperforms VDF on nearly all benchmarks. No shit! Hypercube is designed for fuzzing hypervisors. Uh, VDF is literally just AFL hacked into device I.O. And as I've mentioned before, unless you're fuzzing a file format, AFL is basically garbage. If you transmit a single pointer or you have, like, structured data, AFL is a piece of shit. Like, it's, that's not an insult to AFL, it's just not what AFL is designed to do. It's meant for parsers, single-threaded things, things that aren't super stateful, things that don't have transactions or communications or pointers or structured inputs. Um, obviously, it does well generically, but if you want to fuss a hypervisor, you absolutely are going to just destroy AFL if you actually do a little bit of reverse engineering and, and make device I.O. that makes sense. Um... And we see that a lot in papers and, and open source tools where they just use AFL because apparently no one has found a different way to snapshot something or revert execution without AFL's fork server or mutate anything without using AFL's engine. So that's always really frustrating to me. Obviously, there are plenty of other fuzzers out there, but AFL definitely um, is kind of overused in that sense. It's put into places that doesn't make sense. Um, this is due to the fact that the device simulation in VDF is way too slow. Not surprising. Um, it's based on QMU, and QMU device simulation is, is very slow as well. In addition, the in, uh, increased test throughput of a blind fuzzer outweighs the advantages of coverage feedback. Um, yeah, I, I think I agree with that. I have observed that in the past, and there were times when I would turn off... Basically... Um, Code coverage is only useful if your fuzzer has blind spots. So if your fuzzer is capable of enumerating the entire surface, the entire code surface of a program, then there's no point in having code coverage. It doesn't help you at all. It just slows you down. It adds overhead. It adds complexity. It adds storage, all sorts of things. Um, so ultimately, the more you understand about your target, the more 
of the protocol or specification that you implement and correctly enumerate fully, the less coverage matters. Um, and in that situation, yeah, basically the, the better fuzzer you write, the less you need coverage and thus the more you rather would just have the performance there. That being said, you should be able to get full performance while getting coverage. We know of many different ways that are like less than 2x overhead to do that um, and thus I don't think that's a, a great excuse for performance, not insulting this paper. Um, obviously they're talking about someone else's tool, not their own stuff. Generally speaking, um, all existing fuzzers either isolate a part of the hypervisor code base into a standalone Ring 3 application, stupid, uh, to get code coverage feedback, or are not guided by uh, coverage feedback at all. Uh, existing approaches have significant drawbacks, as we explain in the following. Totally agree with that. I don't know why people haven't been using hypervisors to fuzz uh, for the past 15 years. Um, we've known that you can do that. Uh, there's no new information or new knowledge or anything that is surprising to us. So the fact that we haven't done that yet is kind of um, a testament to basically how slow this industry is moving, um, unfortunately. Uh, and I think a lot of that uh, kind of comes down to pretty much all of academia focusing on um, symbolic execution and static stuff. I remember like... 2012, I was obsessed with symbolic execution, and I wrote some of my first fuzzers, and they were really successful. And then for the next, like, six years, basically until, like, 2018, I just kept wondering why the fuck no one was fuzzing. Because, like, AFL came out, and everyone just thought AFL was all you possibly could do. Once you have code coverage and a bit flipper, that's as good as you can get for fuzzing. There's no room for improvement. Um... And then we saw like in 2017, 2018, this massive shift of academia into fuzzing. Uh, and now that's what basically everyone is doing. And I think that's why we are seeing papers like this now. Um, and I also think this is why this paper, uh, as I'll get into later, kind of is coming late. And that's not an insult to the paper or the authors. It's more of an insult to the industry in general. This paper should have been published in 2010. There's no reason it should have taken this long for a paper like this to come out. Um, so we're going to talk about that a bit more. Uh, once again, not a problem with the authors or this paper. It's more of a problem with the industry because these problems were read like if you did any system level or hypervisor fuzzing, this would have been immediately apparent that this is the correct solution to go. Um, so I think uh, that's kind of frustrating to me that it took so long. Um, academic papers are just another way to share your knowledge. Yeah, they link into the web of everything. That's really important. Um, like I write a b bunch of blogs where I talk about a bunch of cool things, but it's hard to find blogs. Academic papers are basically webbed together with references, and those references are huge for communicating ideas and basically expanding on previous knowledge. But I also think it leads to um, a lot of people not really pushing the boundaries. A lot of people kind of adding additional things to existing work, um, and it's pretty rare to see a paper that really changes the course and the way that things are done. Like this paper uh, is probably going to be really good here, but ultimately um, it's probably going to be building on a lot of the properties that were talked about in papers earlier this year or late of last year. Um, and ultimately I would have liked to see some divergence and just a willing to take a bigger risk um, uh, just in academia in general, but obviously that doesn't trivially turn into funding and then you have to answer the hard questions of why did you do it differently which is not a fun thing to defend um all right um on the one hand isolating individual device emulators requires significant manual effort absolutely um that being said um as a security researcher as someone who has done hypervisor research in the past Hypervisors are very critical surface. That's been mentioned by this paper. I don't think we disagree there. Thus, I don't give a shit about manual effort. I don't care. I don't care if it takes you two years to write a fuzzer for your hypervisor. They are that sensitive and that important that that should totally be justifiable. There should be no reason that there should be any rush to do something quickly or fast or generically. Everything should be super hyper-focused and specific. I would not use a Hyper-V fuzzer on VMware. I just wouldn't. I wouldn't even bother. I'd just start writing another one. They're both 
valuable enough and critical enough surfaces that I can't say I really care about manual effort. Obviously, if you want to get a paper, you have to automate things so that you can prove that you have like made society faster and more productive. But ultimately, these are things that warrant a large amount of manual use, in my opinion. Um, hence, such methods do not scale across different hypervisor implementations. Once again, there are so few that it doesn't really matter. Like, they're just... There may be 10 different hypervisors out there, and I added like six hypervisors on top of the four that I could recite quickly. Um, so, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, even worse, they risk introducing bugs that cannot be triggered in the original version, a false positive. Um, and more importantly, they can hide bugs that would other be found, uh, false negatives. I don't really understand where that fits in here uh because we're talking about scaling across hypervisor implementations and manual effort and then getting bugs that can't be triggered in the original i don't think we've established what the original version is um oh the original version of a device basically um a implementing a device incorrectly and emulating incorrect behavior okay um to avoid this uh one has to be very careful to reproduce the original environment of the device emulator faithfully. I don't think that's going to be accomplished in this paper. Um, in addition, this approach is unable to test the parts that cannot easily be extracted. I agree. On the other hand, blind fuzzing is, a, is very efficient if a precise generator of the expected behavior is given. Ah, sweet. Nice. Perfect. I'm glad to see that. Um, uh, let's see. Unfortunately, this method fails to uncover interesting, especially security critical behaviors in most complex devices and interfaces within a hypervisor. Of course, because the, the perfect fuzzer is theoretical and it doesn't exist. Um, most research, uh, most recent research in the general area of fuzzing has focused on coverage guidance as a feedback loop. Uh, time and time again, experiments have shown that coverage guided fuzzing can drastically improve the ability to find software faults. Modern coverage-guided fuzzers can learn how interesting inputs uh, look without a precise specification. Even in the case where a specification is given, coverage-guided fuzzing can greatly increase the ability to test interesting behavior over blind fuzzing. I think that's a little repetitive, but yes, absolutely. Like, yep, coverage guidance is good. Um, in this paper, we present, prevent, uh, present Nix, which I unfortunately have an old tool I named Nix, so now I'm sad. Um, a novel fuzzer up. Oh, there it is. There's novel. So we're going to have to see. We're going to have to see, is this novel? Um, I think the answer actually today is yes, unfortunately. Uh, so we can't rip it apart on that regard. Uh, using coverage guided fuzzing. As we will see later, our approach significantly outperforms Hypercube on complex devices, re-establishing the, uh, the observation that coverage guidance offers significant advantages over blind fuzzing. Once again, kind of repeating that. We've seen that like six times already. Um, this holds even if... Uh this holds even if it comes with a significant reduction in test throughput. Totally agree with that. Implementing, implementing coverage-guided hypervisor fuzzing without relying on manually created harnesses introduces its own set of challenges. Now, I would argue that this is a manually constructed harness. I would be very surprised if you are blindly determining how the hypervisor works and you're not supplying hooks and introspection into the layout of devices and what devices are used and constants and globals in the hypervisor to analyze and extract out. So, mm, I don't know about that. I'm very curious to see how this is not manually created. Uh, most significantly, in a full system setting, we uh, typically cannot compile all relevant components with a custom compiler to obtain code coverage. Sweet. I've been saying that for fucking 10 years. Um, finally, finally, we have people switching away from using Clang as the way of getting code coverage, which is basically useless on anything that isn't open source Linux applications. Um, so I'm glad to see that. Additionally, we need to be able to run the target, uh, and I know people have been doing uh, some coverage with binary instrumentation, of course, um, even in the presence of memory corruptions and crashes. Lastly, we need to be able to interact with a diverse set of interfaces. To handle crashes and to 
perform introspection efficiently, we want to run the target component, i.e. the hypervisor we want to test, um, in our own hypervisor. Consequently, a large number of components are running at the same time. The host OS, the host hypervisor, um, in which we can run the target OS within the target hypervisor, in which the agent OS is running, yep, 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 we got nested hypervisors and hypervisors and all the way down. Um, overall, this setup consists of uh, three different operating systems and two different hypervisors. Um, this introduces, introduces additional problems, mainly related to complexity. Each of these components has a non-significant amount of state and seemingly non-deterministic behavior such as timing interrupts. I will be curious if you made this deterministic. To tackle all of these challenges, so okay, so everything's being solved, um, we propose a new design that builds upon features of two existing fuzzing projects. By using Intel Processor Trace, we obtain code coverage information on the code running in our host hypervisor similar to CAFL. Um, furthermore, we use a modified version of Hypercube's custom OS uh, to run inside of the target hypervisor. Based on this setup, we built our coverage-guided hypervisor called Nix that relies on two main features. First, to handle the inherent statefulness and non-determinism of this complex stack, we develop an extremely fast snapshot restoration mechanism. This better, this better be within an order of magnitude of chocolate milk. And I also know it's not, so... Okay, um, an extremely fast snapshot rec restoration mechanism that allows us to reload a whole VM image in the hypervisor many thousands of times per second. Yeah, not a very impressive number, but impressive for the world in general. So I'll give you that. <laughs> I'll give you that. Um, <laughs> for perspective, uh, uh, chocolate milk was 1 million resets per second per core on a 2.4 gigahertz processor. So I will be curious... Um, where they come across, if they say thousands, that sounds like two orders of magnitude already. So, once again, not a big problem. You don't really need the level of perf that I have, unless you do some really sophisticated snapshot fuzzing where you, like, partially run a fuzz case and do some things there. But, that's fine. I'm still going to be critical of that. Um, mainly because I've been telling everyone to use dirty page resetting for the past seven years and no one has done it. And I keep reading papers that claim they do it and they do it in a novel way and it's always a fuck ton slower than what I have shit out in a day. So I don't quite understand why that keeps happening. Um, but at least people are doing it. So I can't, I can't complain that much. Um, ours is too, if there's no devices and no dirty memory, well, we'll see. We'll see, um, but ultimately devices would not slow down my snapshotting mechanism, so that wouldn't really be an effect. Only the dirty pages in that would matter, so. But I recognize I've seen like four or five papers at this point that basically say they outperform my fuzzers um, because mine don't do emu uh, device emulation and thus I would, my fuzzers would experience a, a 100, 100x slowdown in overhead if I were to have a device that has 200 bytes of memory that I have to restore each fuzz case. Um, so I am kind of sick of seeing that um, because, yes, I don't handle devices, so you can say that is a, a limitation of the feature set that I provide, but it doesn't have an indication really on the performance. Um, but I recognize, uh, like, this is probably building using existing hypervisors, and other hypervisors are typically slow and have shitty overheads. Um, so let's see here. Uh, second, to efficiently generate uh, inputs for a diverse set of interfaces, we design a new mutation engine that uh, uses user-provided specifications. Um, hard disks wouldn't slow you down, it would just be in RAM. It would just be in RAM, and I would map the entire hard drive into virtual memory, and I'd dirty page restore the hard drive. And given that a hard drive is often not accessed even for multiple seconds in a fuzz case, I would never expect that to even remotely be a slowdown. Um, by the time that you're using a hard drive, you, like, 
you've been running a fuzz case for probably hundreds of milliseconds. Like, uh, uh, hard drives are very, very, very rarely used in the CPU domain. Like, if I'm running a five millisecond fuzz case, there's probably not a disk write scheduled. Even if that application I'm fuzzing wrote to disk, that probably won't actually occur for like two seconds, which is in an eternity. But ultimately, yeah, that would just be dirty page restored, just like everything else. And so basically, the cost of doing device resets in chocolate milk would be I would have to have another page table walk. So I have a page table walk. Um, well, technically I use the uh, page modification log out of the hypervisor and reset all of the guest pages. And then I'd have to do one more page table walk to basically determine which memory um, needs to be reset in the like device state. As long as all of the device state is in virtual memory, which it would be, um, I can just reset that differentially too. And if a device is not touched or it's rarely accessed, it would just be the same overhead um, with the exception of the additional page table walk, which is very cheap, right? A page table walk um, for a fast path where the device has not been modified is a single memory read. Unless you're using more than 512 gigs of uh, device state. So um, let's see here. If you use KVM to reset an empty VM, uh, you end up getting millions of cases. Okay, sounds good to me. Um, but basically that comes down to building off of other people's device emulation. And other people's device emulation sucks, wasn't designed for fuzzing. The buffers are typically not organized in a linear access pattern such that you're doing a bunch of random access patterns. You're filling up a shit ton of cache and you're not tracking which memory has been dirtied or which device state has been modified. So typically device state is not modified or uh, restored differentially. Um, so, yeah, I do think that is part of resetting. If you're doing differential memory restores, but you're not differentially doing disk or um, doing copy on write on disk and discarding changes or differentially restoring devices, um, then yeah, I think that I think that is a valid a valid criticism. Um, not that it's fucking easy. There's a reason why I basically would only do that by writing my own devices because I would register, well, we've talked about it on stream before, but ultimately my solution to this problem is to make a custom allocator and that every time you want to allocate something for the device state, you use that custom allocator and then that custom allocator has a virtual memory backing where all of the allocations are filled of, just like a, a linear allocator because devices don't temporarily do allocations um, and thus basically reset that, treat it as an opaque blob, even put the VM register state in there. And at that point, the registers, the, um, the VM state, the device state, all are just treated as two page table walks. So one to walk the guest virtual memory to get the, uh, the uh, VTX dirty pages, and then one to get the host dirty pages, which contains your register state, your device state, all of those things. If you want to do that, I actually don't think that would be too hard to do in QMU. Literally just hook malloc. Hook malloc, make it a linear allocator, and then throw that the malloc buffers in your page table reset code. And like, now, now you have that. And as long as you keep it compact. You don't have to walk the entire page table. You only have to walk the address ranges that could potentially include that data. Um, so like that would basically get the same performance on the devices. Um, we did that. Okay, sweet. All right. So uh, we will see. I still think you should be able to get more than thousands a second, but we'll see. I don't know how much you're using devices or what, what your benchmarks are for empty cases, so we will get to that. Um, all right, where were we? We lost track. Um, second, we did read this before, but we'll just repeat it. Um, second, uh, to effectively generate inputs for diverse sets of interfaces, we design a new mutation engine that uses um, user-provided specifications. Um, the mutation en uh, engine generates and mutates inputs that are effectively exp uh, effectively expressing highly optimized test playbooks of multi multiple interactions. So that actually sounds really interesting to me. Um, I love making like stateful fuzzers and it's a really hard problem. So I can't wait to see how that has been tackled here. Um, these inputs are custom bytecode programs encoded as directed 
acyclic graphs, DAGs. Um, the user can provide a specification to the fuzzer that describes the semantics of the bytecode and implicitly the shape of the graphs produced. Additionally, we use the idea of affine types, uh, a class of type systems that ensure each value is used at most once. OK, cool. Makes sense. Um, this allows uh, the specifications to ha properly handle cases where resources are freed or closed during testing. Using this highly flexible approach, we demonstrate adapting the fuzzer to multiple targets. We first implement a generic fuzzing specification for emulated devices, similar to state-of-the-art fuzzers. To demonstrate the strength and flexibility of our approach, we build more precise specifications uh, for some of the more complex devices and even demonstrate the targeting uh, that targeting modern para-virtualized vert IO uh, devices becomes possible. So that's awesome to hear. I can't wait to see more and kind of how that is all shaped. Um, that sort of stuff is really important. Being able to express uh, flow like that um, basically is something you can find people allude to, but not something people have really built for real world cases, especially something like a hypervisor. Um, so that's definitely rare and I can't wait to see that. Um, I do hope that the mutation is separate enough from the um, hypervisor like harnessing side of things, um, because if you're fuzzing something else or you don't want to learn the expressiveness of this, it might be useful to use the harnessing and the processor trace stuff, but not have to use that uh, fuzzer. Um, our evaluation shows that this approach consistently outperforms both coverage guided and blind state of the art hypervisor fuzzers. Yep, like, of course, you wouldn't publish a paper on it until you get that result. Um, during the evaluation, we found 44 new bugs in current versions of hypervisors that were previously tested uh, by state of the art fuzzers. At the time of the writing, 22 CVEs have been requested, from which five vulnerabilities have already been fixed by the maintainers. Okay, that's a pretty good fix rate. Happy to see that. That means these are definitely tangible and real bugs. Um, in summary, we make the following three key contributions. We present and design. Uh, we present the design and implementation of Nix, a uh, coverage-guided full-system hypervisor fuzzing tool that found 44 new software faults in current hypervisors. Um, we show a highly optimized full VM reload mechanism that can be uh, used to significantly accelerate uh, fuzzing by reloading a whole v image, VM image many thousands of times per second. Uh, cool. Um, I, yeah, I, I would hope so. Um, and then we, uh, we introduce the concept of an affine-typed structured mutation engine and demonstrate the benefits and flexibility of such mutations. That, to me, is kind of the most interesting part of this. Uh, we've seen hypervisors that have coverage. Uh, we've seen hypervisors that do um, uh, basically dirty page-based resets. We've even seen userland things that do that and custom drivers that do that. But this is really what stands out to me as kind of the most impressive part. And then, of course, wrapping it all together. Um, so I will be curious to see what we get there. Um, all right, so I will catch up on chat. All right. Um, empty case is trivial ring three program starting in and exiting. Okay. Um, yeah, fair point. Yeah, that will definitely probably uh, dirty some memory. Um, okay. Let's see here. What's up, my dude? Hell yeah, Geek Pirate. How's it going? Um... Is he reviewing this for a journal, or is this article already published? It's already published. Um, I'm not, and I'm not an official reviewer. Um, that's not what I do here. I just critique things and then just be an asshole. Um, so that's what I'm here to do. Um, but yeah, all right. I don't think there's anything too crazy on chat. I have to read, so I'm gonna just keep going. Um, technical background. We now discuss uh, some of the technical properties of hypervisors that make fuzzing hypervisors challenging and introduce the techniques needed for fuzzing uh, for efficient hypervisor fuzzing. Okay, hypervisors, sometimes called virtual machine monitors, um, manage sharing hardware resource uh, sharing hardware resource to uh, virtual machines also termed guest, within a host operating system running on a physical machine. In modern systems, this is usually implemented with the help of specific CPU features, such as, 
sorry, uh, specialized uh, instructions and access protection schemes that separate the memory and CPU states used by different VMs. Similar protection schemes can be used to prevent VMs uh, directly accessing the hardware. Instead, generally speaking, emulated hardware is provided by the hypervisor. In some cases, real hardware that cannot be emulated easily uh, can be passed through, e.g. graphics cards. Okay, Tramp VM exit and pair virtualization. Any privilege instruction, such as interaction with emulated hardware, that happens inside of the VM is trapped and control is transferred back to the hypervisor via a VM exit transition. The hypervisor can emulate the privileged operation and return to the virtual machine. This allows the hypervisor to emulate non-existing devices and apply additional security checks. Generally speaking, the VM accesses emulated devices either via memory map to I.O. or using port I.O. Hypervisors can set a trap condition for, ent uh, for entire MMIO regions. Um, upon access to the MMIO region, the VM exits to the hypervisor. For IO port operation, the hypervisor uses a different strategy. Uh, you hook the in and out instructions. Either way, the hypervisor captures the VM exit, um, inspects the exit reason, re, uh, reason, and calls the corresponding device emulator. Device emulators are uh, typically the largest, um, but not the only attack surface of hypervisors. I agree with that. Um, since trap and exit emulation can be slow, many modern hypervisors contain the ability to emulate hardware that does not have physical pendants, but reduce communication overhead. If the OS is running inside the hypervi if the OS running inside the hypervisor is aware that it is running in a virtualized environment, it can use these special para-virtualized interfaces. Um, in contrast to real devices that are typically emulated, the protocols used to interact with para-virtualized devices typically use complex structures prepared in the guest memory, containing instructions to execute whole sequences sequences of interactions. This way, the most expensive context switches can be avoided. Yeah, so basically, if you don't understand uh, what that's saying and what para-virtualization is, effectively, if you want to emulate an actual device, like an NVIDIA card, for example, you need to basically hook every access to that card. Um, or actually, we'll say a hard drive, for example. So a hard drive, typically, the hardware flow is you are going to send a command to the hardware. You are then going to wait for an interrupt from that hardware. You're going to check some status of it, you might send an additional command to it, and then eventually you might get access to read that memory itself. Um, but in pair virtualization, it can be understood that basically um, you want to do all of this in one transition or one like VM exit or VM like hypercall sort of situation. Um, so basically, more is done kind of in bulk. And instead of the standard model where you might write some multiple MMIO registers um, in hardware because it's cheap, um, in virtualization, you try to basically limit a single exchange to one exchange rather than like, I poke this to fill in an address, then I poke this to fill in a length, and each one causes a VM exit. Um, basically, it's, it's for perf and uh, reducing overhead. Um, sweet. Petty Detective, thank you so much for the tier one. Hope you're having fun. I know the paper review is a little bit different than what we've been doing in the past few days, and we will get back to the exploitation stuff um, after we get through this paper. Um, all right. Finally got the bootloader unlocked. Oh, yeah, you're working on unlocking some, like, Sony phone or something like that? Um, MediaTek. Oh, MediaTek is, is not known for their code quality for sure. Um, let's see. Uh... All right. Is this guy some PhD researcher? No, I'm just some random, unqualified person who just reads random shit. And I recognize that sounds uh, sarcastic, but no, that's actually true. I'm completely unqualified. Um, oh, nice. This is the first time I'm seeing security research on Twitch. This is so exciting. There are actually a couple channels that do security research in the web domain, in the binary domain. So there's plenty of stuff out there. Um, if this sort of stuff interests you, I, I implore you to check it out uh, and have fun with that. Um, all right, uh, you're in for a hell of a treat, hell yeah, and extremely intelligent, oh, come on, guys, come on, guys, don't, don't say weird shit like that, that makes me feel weird, um, <laughs> it's right up my alley, dude, hell yeah, I'm glad you're enjoying it, um, give up on the Sony phone, read that I had to replace the, uh, motherboard, fuck that, yep, that's gonna be hard, I mean, you just have to go and find a new exploit, 
I cheered 100 bits some moments ago. Thank you so much for that, Lord Alpaca. Sorry, I did miss that. I was not um, reading chat when I was reading the paper. I, ap I apologize for that. Thank you so much. Um, oh, just realized this is a paper from Rube. Uh, you guys have cybersecurity major over there, right? I don't know if they do, um, but I would imagine they probably do. Just missed the raid yesterday. Crazy to watch it back. Yeah, that was nuts, man. Once again, shout out to Michael Reeves. Yeah, we do. Yeah, so they have a bunch of people doing cybersecurity research. I don't know what their curriculum is for uh, someone getting into it and not doing PhD level stuff. But anyways, um, we're going to hop back into it. Challenges for fuzzing hypervisors. Hypervisors are a cornerstone stone of modern cloud infrastructures. As such, their security is of utmost importance in practice. As noted above, most previous research on fuzzing hypervisors used blind fuzzing. Basically, didn't have code coverage. While it is much easier to um, get a basic blind fuzzer to work compared to a coverage-guided fuzzer, they often struggle to explore complex devices unless a lot of work is put into specific generators. Once again, I do think that is important for doing hypervisor fuzzing. Um, like, those bugs are really important. Um, it is hypervisors and like pre-auth network services for like default things that are used worldwide are not things that should be automated or should get the excuse of this is faster. Now, ultimately, if no one's doing anything on them, yep, it's better than nothing. But ultimately, um, for targets like this, um, I think that should be standard. Like, that should be the default. Um, it, it needs to be. They are that important. Um, the only exception is VDF, a project which uh, individual device emulators from QEMU were extracted and fuzzed with AFL in Ring 3. This helps with complex devices. However, the extraction process is very labor-intensive and cannot easily be performed in closed-source hypervisors. Now, um, I don't know. I would say snapshot fuzzing is typically labor-intensive in general. I would be curious to see what the author's opinion is on that. But I think... Unless you are in a vacuum where you're working with people who are doing snapshot fuzzing, it's foreign to people. Uh, like, finding a way to snapshot something or snapshotting something that is running or finding where to hook things or log things or how to get introspection into something is very labor-intensive, I would say. Um, I would say it's pretty comparable, uh, but we'll see um, here. Like... I introduced snapshot fuzzing at Microsoft and people struggled with it. And I did it in the easiest way I could. I used box. I used clean code. I didn't do anything for performance such that um, you didn't have any like races. You weren't trying to quickly get something done or feel like you have time pressures. It was emulating like 50 million instructions a second, which is so slow. It gives you so much time to do heavy-handed hooks and not have to worry about architecting that stuff well. But it's very difficult and very labor-intensive, and a lot of people just avoid it. Um, but I do think that can become easier. Overall, hypervisors are challenging targets for fuzzing as they typically run with very high privileges, making it hard to obtain code coverage information and to handle crashes. Um, additionally, hypervisors are highly stateful as they keep all the state of each guest VM themselves and the emulated hardware. Consequently, during fuzzing, it is difficult to isolate the effect of one single test case and input. Um, previous cases can heavily affect the result of a new test case. I'm glad. Um, once again, we've seen a lot of effort in like AFL and libfuzzer and hongfuzz to do persistent fuzzing, when ultimately persistent fuzzing is not practical for a large majority of critical surfaces. Like networking, it's basically never useful in. Um, hypervisors, not useful in. OS research, typically not very useful in. Um, so yeah, I'm actually glad that has been pointed out because that is something that I think is a big problem with fuzzing and the investments we make into fuzzers. Um, once again, an improvement to fuzzers is an improvement to fuzzers. If we make uh, if we make the, like, uh, you know, persistent mode faster, that's great. But I also recognize that there's a limited set of humans working on doing this information. And in that case, 
that means that that time is not being spent elsewhere. So sometimes when I'm critical of things, it's not because it didn't make it better. Because of course, if you make persistent fuzzing faster, you made persistent fuzzing faster. But it's more of a prioritization criticism of like, I think the time and energy could have been uh, best spent somewhere else. Um, Persistent fuzzing, aka you figure out the resetting. Yeah, I guess in most situations it's it's more like, I hope you didn't touch any state. <laughs> um, but yeah, or figure it out yourself. All right. Um, to prevent this, the fuzzer has to take great care to ensure that the state of the hardware is not affected by the previous test cases. It's just impossible. For example, if one test case disables some emulated hardware, subsequent test cases will not be able to interact with it. Lastly, hypervisors do not consume a single well-formed input. Instead, they provide a variety of different interactive interfaces. Um, some of these interfaces require the guest operating system to set up complex, highly advanced structures in its own memory. Most existing general purpose fuzzers aim at targeting at programs that consume a single binary string. Sweet. So the things that I talked about kind of early during the abstract have been brought up, um, and that's important because I feel like a lot of papers just don't mention these things and like don't recognize that these are problems that we have. So these are all very, very, very good points, uh, albeit obvious, but very good points that are typically not talked about. So I'm glad to see them here. Um, now that we have identified existing challenges in coverage guided fuzzing for hypervisors, uh, we are going to discuss them individually. Okay. Um, so. To handle highly privileged code, fuzzers typically make use of virtualization to create an isolated, externally controlled environment. For example, there are various fuzzers that are built upon KAFL, such as Red Queen and Grimoire. Um, these fuzzers uh, use a modified hypervisor, KVMPT, that allows to trace the code that runs inside of the virtual machine. Furthermore, these fuzzers use QMUPT, an extension that, amongst other things, allows the decode of the traces and obtains coverage information um, by utilizing hardware-assisted trace features such as Intel Processor Trace. Since the fuzzers have full control of the VM and any code running inside of it, they can gracefully handle crashes of complex components such as closed source operating systems. Yep, sounds good to me. Nested virtualization, I might skip through this section. Nested virtualization just lets you run a hypervisor in a hypervisor. Um, we're just gonna brush over that, sorry. like. That's one of the things we're just gonna skip over. Um, it can be as explained as simple as that. You just run a hypervisor in a hypervisor and you have to emulate it in software because there's not hardware acceleration for it. Um, okay, fuzzing stateful applications. Many applications um, are to some extent uh, sta stateful. That is, the execution of one test case is not independent of all previously executed test cases. In many instances, this statefulness is rather obvious. A target that writes the content of the test case to a file on the hard disk and, uh, and fails if the file already exists is obviously stateful. However, it also manifests in such more uh, and more subtle effects. For example, a st many standard hash table implementations use the time to derive a key used to calculate the hashes. We observed that this would occasionally come uh, cause some amount of non-determinism in the code coverage depending on whether or not the keys collide or not. Absolutely. That's why you see me using like B-tree sets and B-tree maps instead of hash maps because I fucking hate the non-determinism of hash maps. Um, if you had to fuzz a subsystem of the Linux kernel, which fuzzer would you use besides your own? I'd only use my own. Like, I wouldn't do anything else but use my own. Like, that's kind of how I work. Uh, I've got basically tools to do everything at this point, um, so that's what I would do. Um, all right, let's see here. Um, is there anything crazy here that I need to follow up on? Doesn't look like it. All right, I'm gonna just keep going then. Um, where were we? Here. Uh, in the context of hypervisors, a significant amount of state is stored in the emulated devices, uh, such as timers in the interrupt controller. These are often very relevant for the behavior of the emulated devices. Um, sorry. 
Uh, thus, for reproducible test cases, it is paramount to control the full state of the hypervisor at the beginning of execution. This is a very hard task. Previous approaches typically tackled this problem in one of two ways. Most blind fuzzers such as Hypercube tried to ignore this aspect by booting into a controlled state and then only execute a single very long test case and reduce the overall environment noise. However, this does not work for coverage-guided fuzzing and also causes problems when a crash is found for a long time in fuzzing. I'm curious if this stuff is fully deterministic because I haven't seen too much on that. I would be impressed. Um, Let's see. Um, lastly, sometimes the fuzzer uh, might get stuck by inevitably, inevitably disabling some device, rendering all future interactions pointless. Um, the only previous coverage-guided fuzzer, VDF, tested only a small fraction of the hypervisor, such as a single device emulator in a Ring 3 QMU process. This allowed them to uh, restart the whole process to reset the device state. The obvious downside is that this approach does not work for large amounts of the attack surface in a typical hypervisor. I totally agree. Uh, hypervisors are targets that should be used in a full emulation layer. Um, basically, that is... Um, if you want to fuzz a hypervisor effectively, um, yeah, you should be running the entire hypervisor either in an emulator or in... Uh, a hypervisor, right? If you can run it in a hypervisor, that's great, but you probably it's hard to get determinism. Um, and yeah, it looks like it's not deterministic, um, which is hard to accomplish. I'm not going to fault it on that. Um, determinism is pretty much impossible to get unless you do some wacky uh, perf counter stuff, uh, which is typically really hard to do a nested vert. You have to run on bare metal, and immediately that makes it unusable for pretty much anyone in the world. Like, I've proposed that, at Microsoft, I've proposed this exact thing, a hypervisor for fuzzing hypervisors, and people ultimately said no, uh, because it doesn't work in the nested vert environment in uh, Hyper-V on Azure, and thus we don't have any compute resources to use it, and thus if it has to run on bare metal, it's kind of useless to us. So we ended up going with an emulator approach, uh, which got us determinism, which was kind of cool. Um, in this paper, we propose uh, to use another approach. We implement our own fork-like mechanism for the ho whole VM. I hate how it's called fork. Like, I wouldn't say these things are fork-like, really. Because fork-like implies that you make something new, um, and this you are replacing old, uh, or you're replacing modified state. It's more like copy on write-like, in my opinion. Um, this has multiple advantages, um, but then again, that's a terminology that everyone says and people are uh, familiar with fork, so I'm not uh, criticizing that. Um, first, it works independently on the targets. Uh, we can use this to overcome statefulness in user space applications, kernel compo components, and of course, hypervisors running in nested inside of our hypervisor. Additionally, we re reset the whole virtual machine, and we can also reset the emulated devices, including tricky components such as trimer interrupts. This also applies for all nested virtual machines. Yeah, totally agree with that. Most current fuzzers provide the target application with one unstructured array of bytes. While this approach is very well suited uh, to target binary file format parsers and similar programs, it is far less useful for interactive applications that follow a well-known pattern of inputs over time, even though the format of each input might be unknown. A surprisingly large number of relevant applications actually behave like this. I'm gonna press X to doubt. That's basically only like image parsers and file parsers. Um, most of the critical surface, most of the surface that, like, actually gets you remote code execution in a non-hyper-sandboxed environment, uh, is stateful. It's network protocols, and it's, uh, like, like, TCP stack remotes, um, and, uh, like, networking bugs, um, and, like, browsers, which are very stateful, uh, big machines with, like, weird execution engines. Like, ultimately, um... For every one bug that's exploited in libjpeg in Chrome, there's probably fucking 30 that are exploited in JavaScript interpretation. Um, so I kind of disagree with that, but I also think that is like a justification of a lot of the effort of most research out there. Like most academic research typically fuzzes those things. But in reality, like 
at Microsoft as a security researcher. Um, the things that are at the top of our list are basically hypervisors, which of course, uh, very stateful. Browsers, of course, very stateful. And then our on by default or commonly used uh, network services like IIS, um, uh, Exchange, Outlook, those sorts of things, which are typically, yes, in theory, um, in like Outlook and browsers, you could maybe land through an image bug, but you're gonna probably use JavaScript to actually get a leak or something else like that. It's very hard to um, basically get a leak and a write out of a, an image parser or something of that sorts. So just getting corruption from one is typically not enough. So you still need a leak. And at this point, I would say like leaks can often be more sparse in lockdown environments than um, actual corruption. And that can make it very difficult to find um, some of those bugs. Like I remember uh, doing Bluetooth stuff back in the day where I had four remote code execution bugs in Bluetooth and I had one leak. If that one leaked, one leak went away, all four of those RCEs are useless. But since that one leak exists, which is very difficult, like leaks over network protocols are pretty rare because uh, it typically requires that a server echoes back information that has a user controlled or influenced length, um, which is not easy to accomplish. Um, so yeah. Um, but we meant to say a lot of uh, software is not like parsers. Oh, okay, sweet. The reference is not clear. All right, then I agree with you. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> for sure. No, I think that's really important, and that's one of the reasons I like this paper. Like, I don't, like, seriously, I don't care about how they did their hypervisor or even how they did their mutator. I just care that finally someone's doing fuzzing in a way that I find applicable to the real life problems that I experience at a real company who has real priorities, right? And ultimately finding bugs in libbfd and command line user tools that aren't exposed over a network is not interesting to me. Like those are not hard to harness. They're not hard to get coverage on. They're not hard to rebuild. They're not hard to write fuzzers for. They're very simple linear tools. Um, so. I don't even care what this paper does. Just the fact that it points that out um, is really awesome. That being said, once again, this sort of stuff should have been happening 10 years ago, right? Not, not to the fault of the authors or the school or the paper, um, but this sort of stuff has been pretty obvious for a long time. And I think a lot of people have ignored it intentionally because it's a hard problem. Like seriously, I, when I read through the, the 50th paper this year that made a slightly different bit flipper for fuzzing libbfd and gdb and object dump, um, sometimes I really wonder if they're just too afraid to actually work on a hard problem. Um, not saying that the work isn't necessarily impressive in those cases, um, but ultimately like those problems are so easily solved. They're not really problems. Like, getting 2% more coverage of a useless thing isn't really that useful. Um, obviously, sometimes those, th those techniques can be generically applicable, but I think what we'll see in here is that this probably doesn't use a lot of existing art. It uses PT, which is great because that's just a library, right? That is a thing that just exists and it does a thing. There's no like really room for improvement there other than perf, which has been done with XPT or X, whatever it is. Um, but I think what we'll find in this paper, it doesn't really benefit from most of the academic research that has occurred over the past eight years. Because a lot of the academic research is for programs you can build that run on Linux, things you can use a custom compiler for, things that already have hooks building on top of AFL, things that only take in a single file and just do one thing, things that work in a persistent mode, like ultimately, those problems are just not, not really the hard ones. Um, they are the ones that everyone's working on. So if you wouldn't know better or you've never worked in industry or you've never tried to actually find an actionable ODE, like an exploitable bug that affects millions of people rather than a bug in a piece of software that doesn't accept untrusted input, e.g. libbfd, right? Um, so yeah, I, I think uh, it's cool to see this. More importantly for us, hypervisors support a multitude of diff different interfaces that can be interacted with, each with um, a different format. 
Similarly, most kernels provide a large number of different interaction points via interfaces and, uh, such as syscalls and ioctals. Um, lastly, even ordinary ring three applications such as network services, applications with a user interface or libraries that provide an API require complex input formats. Yep, totally agree. Consider a simple API where a resource is first created, uh, then any number of operations are performed. Okay, um, I'm just gonna ignore this. It's just a, it's just an example. Um, Grammar-based fuzzers use context-free grammars to approximately describe inputs with uh, such relations. Um, however, uh, while context-free grammars can encode the overall structure um, of individual interactions, they cannot readily express the temporal properties. Um, on a high level, this is due to the fact that, by definition of a context-free grammar, they fundamentally only produce tree-shaped data structures. However, the data flow resulting from chaining multiple interactions fundamentally creates a directed acyclic graph, a DAG. I totally agree. Um, this is well known in the world of JavaScript fuzzers. Hence, modern JavaScript fuzzers use more complex formats, which ensure that previously initialized variables with correct types can be used. Um, additionally, current Current implementations of grammar-based fuzzers are typically not very effective at expressing binary data. Sweet. Yeah, totally agree. Um, another interesting example, example is syscaller. Uh, it was designed specifically to fuzz kernel interfaces with syscalls. Once again, it was designed specifically to fuzz kernel interfaces. And what happened with it? It was really successful and is really successful. So once again, uh, another great example of specialized fuzzers slaughtering competition, right? Um, these format specifications typically can express initialization and use patterns. However, they are typically designed for one specific use case and cannot express the temporal properties, properties uh, such as closed resources that are not to be used later. Totally agree with that. Okay, affine types. Um, sweet, we're finally getting to diagrams, which means that it will feel like we're making more progress through the paper because we're only about a a third of the way through, and I would like to kind of get to um, some of the Android stuff uh, sooner here. So let's, uh, we'll keep going quick. Um, and uh, actually, I'll catch up on check. Um, Intel PT does not handle anything with a JIT very well, um, at least for post humorous example. Yes, it's very difficult for, for JIT, and in reality, um, applications that get dynamically mapped or created, especially to the same address, are virtually indistinguishable from a hypervisor level from JIT. Um, and thus, I've never used PT in hypervisors for that very reason. Now, maybe I've just gotten unlucky with hitting a lot of targets that map things at the same address. Um, but I don't think that's the case. I think processor trace is just very difficult to use in that environment, but it doesn't really matter what you actually use to gather your coverage because you can always replace it with something else. Like you can always replace it with interrupt-based sampling, or you can replace it with single stepping, or you can replace it with um, Intel PT where you basically hook accesses on every page table by mapping them out such that you know when things are dynamically mapped, or you um, make sure that Pages are execute only, such that you can see if they're written to and you can invalidate your caches, right? You can make PT work in those environments. It's just a lot of work, and it can often start to gradually increase that overhead to where it's no longer this whiz-bang, super fast um, coverage mechanism. But it's solvable, right? The problems are solvable. You just have to pay a penalty, whether it's code complexity or performance, to accomplish it. Um, we handle code that is dynamically mapped. Yeah. Do you handle code that's dynamically mapped at the same address? Unmapped and remapped is shitty. Yeah. Yeah. So that's uh, that's basically my first experience. The first thing that I ever fussed with a hypervisor uh, was Microsoft Word. And Microsoft Word would dynamically load DLLs uh, based on the format of the file. Um, and obviously, if you're doing a snapshot fuzzer, and it would unload them too, which it was the biggest problem. It would load them and then unload them. So if you take a snapshot at the start of a case, uh, the DLL which gets loaded at the next free virtual address uh, is influenced by the um, data or the format of the file, uh, which sucks. And maybe that's not a very common case. Um, I know Linux would actually probably avoid that the way it does ASLR, um, but 
Um, I've been influenced and biased by that, right? That was an early experience I had, and that was one of the reasons I was kind of driven away from PT, uh, which sucks. So, yeah, that might not be a common thing, but since I've hit it, right, and that's why, like, sometimes experience is not good, because that might have been a rare experience, and if that's a rare experience, then, well, I have fucked myself by basically avoided using a, a really cool technique. That being said, uh, when I did my first hypervisors, uh, PT was not accessible in a virtual machine. You could only use it um, in a kernel, um, and thus it wasn't really ready yet, so I never really started with it, and to be honest, I haven't done hypervisor fuzzing since then. Um, so I guess chocolate milk I could have used PT, um, but ultimately I was kind of plagued by previous experiences, but yeah. LD preload, all the libraries in question were for Linux. Yeah, so I agree with that, but once again, um, so what I, what I tried to do on Windows was I tried to basically scrub everything. So I'd run like my coverage corpus, my non-crashing coverage corpus through Word once to hopefully make sure that all of the memory is warmed up. Once again, remember, I am fuzzing this in an environment where I don't emulate devices. Um, so I want to make sure like all the files are touched such that they're cached in memory because I can't read a file that's on disk. Um, I need to make sure everything's paged in and everything is touched in memory. Um, so to do that, I kind of like tried to warm up Word and get that working. There were a couple things that it like dynamically generated fucking strings to load library and they were dynamically opened with load library and thus there was like no way to like even know what could be opened. I remember like after a week of fuzzing, I would just hit some like new bug and I would be like, how did I not hit this bug before? And it was because the that DLL was like dynamically in system 32 and it was paged out or, and for some reason on that snapshot, it had been touched recently enough that it was in cache and thus didn't cause a, a hardware um, termination of the fuzz case. So a bunch of annoying shit like that. PT is a gigantic pain, nasty to decode. That's one of my issues. Um, as you've seen, I write all my own code. And since I write all of my own code, for me to use PT, I would have to write a length decoder, right? Um, now, honestly, that would probably take two days for me to do, but I just have always had kind of more important things to do. Um, but I'm not the kind of person who's going to just pull an existing off-the-shelf decoder, and that's obviously going to slow me down and impact uh, my efficacy, but I like having that control and understanding the properties. We saw that with libxpt where they got like, what was it, a fucking 10, 50x, 100x performance improvement? That is exactly why I don't use libraries, because ultimately, every time I use a library, I end up bottlenecking on the library. Like, I can be running 10 million VMs a second and resetting the shit out of them and I look and I'm bottlenecking on like some library's allocator and it's like really really this stupid library that I'm using to decode a couple instructions is truly the bottleneck when I'm creating and restoring millions of VMs a second and yeah in a lot of situations it is um especially when you're doing fuzzing a lot of software is not designed to be reset that quickly so yeah um, you don't get information about compares, which is a, a, a deal breaker for a lot of things. To be honest, I don't think the compare tracking is that big of a deal. I, I think it is if you have a shitty corpus, and I think a lot of academia uses shitty corpuses, and you know why? It's exactly what I hit on earlier. The shittier your corpor corpus, the better and more improvement that you can get through coverage mechanisms and feedback. But in reality, if you're fuzzing something and you actually make a thorough corpus and you go through as a human and you try to find good examples on the internet and you make generators or you write programs that exercise the behavior to cause capture that you can tra uh, cause traffic that you can capture, you'll find that a lot of these things just don't matter, right? Like, What's, what's compare coverage going to get you in RTF? It's going to get you the tokens of the RTF. Well, I hope to fuck you have a dictionary of all the tokens in RTF, and I hope you have a shit ton of RTF files where you can parse them and basically make a unique set of all of the tokens in your database. Same for PDFs, same for documents, or any structured data. Um, so in that regard, I don't think compare solving is that big of a deal. To be honest, I recognize it's an improvement if you have no good corpus and thus for like 
developer CI pipeline fuzzing. But for doing the stuff like what I do, looking for like the critical ode that makes fucking headlines or like gets a patch out of cycle, it's just not going to do anything for you because to get even remotely deep enough into those targets, um, you're going to need to have a pretty complex fuzzer in the first place. And at that point, the compare stuff isn't going to get you too much. Now, it might get you some stuff. I'm not saying it won't. Um, but the value of coverage guidance and ad advanced guidance features that go beyond coverage um, exponentially diminishes um, as you get a better fuzzer, right? And maybe not exponentially, I just made that up, but I would say for compare coverage, that's probably the case. Um, that being said, also, things like compare coverage are often not practical for full system fuzzing. Um, you have too many contexts, too many different processes running, too much noise on the system, too many things whizzing around that you end up tracking too much information and you end up basically polluting your uh, databases, your feedback mechanisms with a bunch of noise data, a bunch of data that isn't relevant. Uh, and the only way that you can really isolate that is by doing um, taint tracking or some level of like taint approximation and making sure that you don't do coverage on things that are not influenced by user input. But even then, if you have a non-deterministic fuzzing environment, or even if you have a deterministic fuzzing environment, um, if you execute four more instructions in a for loop, and that causes you to delay execution of scheduling a thread, which then causes that thread to get picked up on a different execution flow, which then causes another thread to get preempted at a different time, you will avalanche. The entire system will become tainted. And that's ultimately because um, that input has influenced the, the state of the entire system because it has basically changed when a context switch occurred. Now, obviously you can try and reduce that information, but the higher resolution taint tracking that you get, the more information and higher overheads that you have. It's really hard. It's really, really hard. Um, that being said, if I'm not mistaken, Intel has talked about uh, potentially making compare tracing hardware features. Um, I have no idea how they plan to do that, but it's probably like a stream of things and maybe uh, it's probably going to look something like uh, PT, but I've heard um, that they are looking at doing uh, stuff like that. Whether or not they will, who knows, because they're getting kicked by AMD, so maybe they will um, divert some resources into making processors that don't suck. Um, Hey, Gamozo, I'm the dude auditing Android. Just found some dank code smell and some encouragement. Awesome. You find that first uh, little, um, like a null deref or something that gets you going? Newer CPUs allow you to inject data into the PT stream. Yeah, with doing the, um, I forget what it's called. But yeah, I have seen that. Um, this may be the hundredth time someone asked this, but is reversing a game and writing some hacks for it, uh, bypassing anti-cheat, a viable starting point to get into binary exploitation and low-level hacking? Um, it's going to teach you assembly, but that's not really going to teach you exploitation or hacking. But absolutely, it will get you um, debugging skills and a reverse engineering skills and, and code auditing skills and like a bunch of those skills that do go hand in hand, but directly, no. Um... But yes, there's plenty of overlap there. Um, let's see. Cockeyes, thank you so much for... Or, or cockies, not cockeyes. Thank you so much for the five months of sub. Hell yeah, thank you so much. Glad to see you keep coming back. Bunch of people keep coming back. Good to see that. All right. Um, a fiend types. Um, I can't remember if we got through any of this, but I don't think we did. Uh, for many cases, the inability to express that a closed resource is not reused later is... Um, is not a big problem. In other cases, this can cause false positive crashes. For example, ignoring a library library's contract will lead to false positive crashes, e.g., by uh, by bypass or by passing a previously freed pointer to the library. Yep. If you provide corrupt things to the mem copy, you will get crashes. Um, these are not interesting to us as they do not represent a security issue in the library, but rather simply our inability to properly use the library. Yeah, we've seen that before, um, for sure. I love that. Um, 
One can address this issue by using affine types. Affine types are a class of type systems that ensure each value is used at most once. Consequently, they ensure that a resource is not reused until it was closed. Okay. Um, in this paper, we design a new formalism based on affine types that allow us to express these kinds of constraints with a focus on versatility. The, the user specifies a set of opcodes. Each opcode represents a single function call and can take uh, any number of arguments uh, and return any number of values. The arguments can either be consumed or borrowed. Um, once a value was consumed, the fuzzer ensures that it will not be used in future opcodes. Thus, one can effectively specify sequences of affinely typed function calls. Um, in a way, this approach is rather similar to how Rust uh, uses uh, move and borrow semantics. Using this mechanism, it becomes trivial to express well-formed interactions such as the ones seen in listing one. Yeah, okay, I agree with that. Um, how is affine pronounced? I say uh, affine, affine. I've always say, said affine, but I don't really care. <laughs> um, let's see. Okay, uh, design. In the file, uh, affine, shit. <laughs> Welp, affine, affine. Yeah, I guess it's affine. Huh, well, affine. Yeah, I'm just going to say whatever comes to my head. Um, in the following, we describe the, uh, the design and the reasoning behind design choices of Nix. Uh, we start by giving an informal threat model for hypervisor security. Based on this threat model, we describe our fuzzing approach. Sweet, I like that. Uh, basically, um, you can use a VM bug to get control of everyone on a, a cloud box. Cool. Um, all right. Um, Architecture overview. To identify uh, such security vulnerabilities by fuzzing hypervisors, uh, we have to tackle a number of challenges, and we kind of mentioned those challenges e the earlier, so we're going to skip that too. All right. Um, high performance coverage guided fuzzing. Broadly speaking, there are two approaches to obtain the coverage information to perform uh, feedback guided fuzzing. One, compile time instrumentation and binary only approaches. Um, yep. Uh, we choose to use we choose to use binary only coverage tracing as we believe um, that requiring a custom compiler toolchain severely increases the effort to obtain a working setup for fuzzing. You've heard it here first. Academia has discovered that not all code is open source. <laughs> um, with our setup, for example, the binaries as published by major distributions can be used with no further compilations. Yes, I don't have to figure out people's build systems all day and try to figure out how to fix that they don't use CC and they hard code GCC in their entire thing. And I don't have to make sim links to AFL GCC. <laughs> Hell yeah. Um, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna kind of skip through that pretty quick. I think we're gonna skip through a lot of this stuff. Stable and deterministic fuzzing. Um, let's see what they do. To gracefully recover, they reset the VM. Uh, and now we're kind of getting to the part where we skip it because um, a lot of these backing details, uh, I think we've kind of already discussed when we've gone on tangents. Um, by using a hardware accelerated feature called page modification logging, PML, KVM can efficiently identify which pages um, need to be reset. So basically, Intel has a thing that will log pages when the dirty bit gets set for the first time in page tables. It will log that to the page modification log. That's it. Um, so you can get a list of all of the things that have been dirtied. Um, okay, and it's going to talk more about that. Basically, if you know what memory has been written to, you know which things you have to be reset, which have to be reset. If things haven't been written to, then it's impossible that they aren't in the state that you started at and you can skip resetting those and copying that memory. Um, so that's really important. Communication with nested virtualization. To be able to communicate directly with the fuzzer from our agent OS, we need to provide hypercalls uh, from the agent running in L2 directly to KVMPT. Um, due to the way nested vert is implemented, hypercalls are passed to the host, KVMPT, first and later forwarded to the hypervisor uh, running in L1. Ah, okay. Um, I don't know if that's in the fuzzing loop, but if that's in the fuzzing loop, like that's... That's not easy. That's a slow process. Like all hypervisors are very slow at hypercalls. Um, 
And I think that's one big advantage that I can get is that I don't have hyper calls because the VM is beneath me where my fuzzer is running. Um, consequently, we implemented special hyper calls and corresponding handlers that avoid being forwarded to the target hypervisor. Right? If you do any of this stuff in user space, um, like the the user space to kernel, just to, just the cost of doing almost a single syscall is basically the cost of me doing a VM reset. So if you're using a syscall or something to do a hypercall all the way, uh, you basically have lost a shit ton of overhead just to the syscall, right? Syscalls are very expensive. They're on the order of like 200 to 400 cycles. Um, and checking whether or not you need to reset memory with the page modification log costs half a cycle. You need to read a value to determine if it's non-zero. And if it's non-zero, then you need to read values off an array to restore those pages. Um, but those interactions, like syscalls and hypercalls, are incredibly expensive operations. Um, but yeah. And that's something that's really hard to avoid. Like, there's not much that you can do to avoid that if you don't write your own custom OS or basically import your entire fuzzer into the hypervisor. But basically, they added some hypercalls that allow them to communicate uh, kind of with their, uh, their fuzzing harness. Um, makes sense. You need a way to communicate with that. Um, all right. OK. Um, let's see. There's some cases where cache timings mess with this. Yes. I mean, basically, the, the non-determinism non that you get from basically any hypervisor-based fuzzing is if you loop for a little bit longer, you will cause all future threads to get scheduled at a different point in time. And if everything gets scheduled at a different point in time, then when you come back to execute, you're in a completely different like state depending on what you track. If you only track state belonging to like one CR3, you can ignore a lot of that system noise. But if you're doing system level fuzzing and you want to know all of the activity on the entire system, including like kernel and user transitions, like you will affect uh, a lot of the system just through basic like loop depths. And the longer you loop, the more caches affect because they they avalanche, right? If if uh, if your caches are increasing your cost by five percent, the more you loop, the higher chance that that eventually bubbles up to being a new boundary where you get scheduled at different domains, and then at that point everything has changed, right? Because you've had a context switch into a different address in the kernel at a different location. Um, and you can filter all of that stuff out, but if you are interested in that information, it becomes very difficult. Um, but yeah, you can typically just kind of rerun things until you get the value that you want, um, or you can ignore it entirely because often those non-determinism aspects do not affect the... Um, like, typically, you're storing, like, edges. So you might get an additional edge due to an interrupt on a different boundary, which is not that big of a deal, especially if you maybe filter out interrupt edges. Um, and I think PT even allows you to do that in some way or another. I can't remember if you can filter out exception taken uh, logs, but I think they're logged as, like, exception taken, and thus you can easily just filter those out in post. Um, but, yeah, it's... It's not a huge issue unless you're running like pretty long fuzz cases. So like at Microsoft, we have a couple like really, really stateful fuzzers that run for seconds or even minutes. So determinism is important there because then everything does converge to different after like a second of running. But if you're fuzzing a hypervisor driver for a half a second or something like that, none of this stuff will really be an effect on uh, kind of the coverage and the feedback that you do. So... Um, Determinism is a lot of work to get, um, and it's. I think it is important for generic fuzzers, like people who are writing standard fuzzers, because traditionally when people write fuzzers, they run for a couple seconds because the overheads are so high that they can't just fuzz one interaction. Um, and due to that, um, you end up with situations where people don't have skills or knowledge in building fuzzers that just like throw one input often they will throw multiple or do a loop or iterate over multiple packets and if you have a non-deterministic fuzzer it can be a problem in, for that um, just because the longer things execute the more that non-determinism starts to affect and uh, affect the state of kind of the whole system so 
That feeling when no processor trace for AMD? Yep, there's none at all. There is a an undocumented feature that allows you to um, get a trace of all the instructions that execute, but it's quite slow. And then there's another uh, feature called um, LWP. Uh, yeah, lightweight profiling. It only works in the user land, and it only allows you to like record the addresses of every like. 64 instructions so it's like it skips but that's good enough because you can just offset it at the start and you can pick up everything by running inputs through multiple times which ultimately that's what fuzzers do like naturally fuzzers repeat constantly they they jam the same input through over and over and over again so yeah but amd is, is basically at a um at a disadvantage there Okay, uh, generic fuzzing of interactive targets. Um, here we're talking about that bytecode specification. Here we go. Let's actually read about it. Um, to allow generic fuzzing of interactive... Uh, I feel like I just read that. Okay, to allow generic fuzzing of interactive systems, we provide the user with a simple mechanism to describe a grammar of possible interactions. As our goal behind the fuzzing engine was to be as generic as possible, we aim to build a mechanism as general... Um, uh, as general as context-free grammars, incorporating the constraints discussed in section 2.3.3. Specifically, we aim to express general interactions with temporal create, use, delete, do not reuse constraints. Okay, I think we talked about that quite a bit, so let's keep going. Um, each input is represented by a special, uh, a special DAG. Um, each node uh, is a single function uh, call Okay, each node is a single function call, and each edge is a typed value returned by the source function and passed to the target function. Functions can take arguments either as a value or as reference. If an argument is used as a value, it cannot be used um, later in any of the nodes. Thus, uh, the value is effectively deleted. Um, interesting. So, does that lack the expressibility to do like a talk tau? where you want to basically keep reusing the same object or like a use after free, where you want to use an object after it's been uh, discarded um, or you want to initiate the use of it. It depends where the code is, right? You don't want to provide a use after free in user land um, or wherever your fuzzer is. You can always use a reference. Okay, cool. Um, all right. If an argument is used as a value, um, okay. Okay, that, so by value. This is literally by value, so by move. Um, any node uh, or function can take an arbitrary number of inputs, uh, both as reference and value, and can return any number of values. In addition, those inputs um, and outputs, each function, in addition to those inputs and outputs, each function can have an additional data argument that can contain arbitrary tree-shaped data structures. So basically, you can nest it, um, or not necessarily nest it, you can have a, you can have a tree inside of it. Um, so yeah, this totally makes sense. Um, it, it's basically how you would lay out an API, right? The, the interactions of those. And I like how you're uh, using Rust syntax here. Um, but we have the diagram here where we have kind of these different states. Um, open can go, like a path can be passed to open as a parameter. Open can be called uh, as a function or it can go to write as a function, which um, I don't see arrows out of that. Or I guess it can call right, and then it can go back up, maybe. Um, and then open can call clo uh, dupe or close. So like all of these interactions are valid. Or more specifically, this probably means that you pass a path into open, and then open uh, gives you a, an output, which you can pass into write, dupe, or close. And you can do those in any order or sequence. Um, oh, f is a file. OK, makes sense. Sorry. Yeah, but that totally makes sense. Um, to be honest, I, I think that's like, pretty intuitive, um, but it's like, that doesn't mean it's not impressive. It's the correct way to do it, I think. Um, let's see. Uh, I would say this is pretty comparable to how like syscaller does it, right? When you, when you look at it from like a data like perspective, it's basically keying things of where they can be. It's d describing the usage of different parameters and return values and kind of classifying the flow of those, um, which is good. That's the correct way to write these sorts of fuzzers. I totally agree with that. I, I have no complaints about that. Um, blah, blah, blah. 
Yes, and the only difference is that we have by ref and move semantic. Yeah, and I think that's a, a, a great property to have that differentiation. Um, that really helps express certain things. So yeah, like close, right, doesn't take it by reference. Um, although arguably, like, in some situations, you might want to call close on something which um, you've already closed. Like, in Chrome, I've had bugs like that in IPC where you can basically ask it to close the same thing again, and like there's just like a dangling pointer somewhere. Um, but that being said, I don't think that's a, a, a big issue. Um, the target component parses the graph stored in the shared memory. To ease this task, we automatically compile the bytecode specification to a single C header file that implements a bytecode interpreter. To compile the bytecode, the user has to provide a C implementation of the behavior of each node. Okay, this is really cool. So basically, the user has to specify how to handle what these nodes do. So like, if you are open, you have to implement like invoke syscall open and pass in these arguments in this order or whatever. Um, and I think that's really cool, to be honest. Um, first of all, you, you're kind of required to, right? If you want to generically express something, you kind of have to use um, this design. Um, but it's really cool because this is, this is what I would say most people have been doing for fuzzing in the closed domain or industry domain. Um, like, we have fuzzers at Microsoft that go back to, like, 2012 that do this sort of thing where they're kind of aware of these types. Um, back at old jobs, we had like fuzzers that went back to fucking early 2000s that like basically this is the right way to fuzz. I'm so happy to see this because a lot of things don't talk about this, um, which, is, which is really fucking cool. A lot of work has to go into defining each of these functions. Is there a way to automate the process based on traces? Um, so I guess I don't know for their specific implementation, but yeah, typically a lot of work has to go into these things, but you can automate the generation of these, right? So like these are syscalls, right? All of these things are syscalls. Well, the path isn't, but these are all syscalls. So I can write a tool that will go through and get the prototypes of every syscall in the Linux kernel. And I can use those, and especially if it's strongly typed, I can see that like open returns an FD. And then write consumes an FD. And I can do regex, AST stuff, lossy parsing, a bunch of different things to kind of pre-generate a root level base thing to use. And that's what like syscaller does. It kind of generates, um, I don't know if it does it directly from headers, but basically you can make like a specification or auto generate a specification from, and like kind of build yourself up, right? You can parse man pages, you can do AI to try to interpret some of the behaviors of these things. But ultimately at the end of the day, um, if you wanna make them as fully operable as possible, you, you want to manually specify things. So like for example, um, if you open a device, you are going to want to do different things based on what device you open. And a generic thing is not going to give you that, right? You could make a generic thing that does give you that, but at that point, you've written a specific generic automata automation tool. And at that point, have you really made it generic? Or are you just making an automatic header parser or like man page parser that does exactly the things that you want it to do? Um... But yeah, those are kind of tricks that you can do. Um, but yeah, ultimately, yes, you want to do them manually. And the way, like, we've done that that at Microsoft. We've used syscall at Microsoft on the Windows kernel, and we ported it over. And I think the first thing that we did is we made something that consumed headers, and especially in Windows where things are strongly typed, um, or often a little bit more strongly typed than they are in Linux land. Because uh, Linux uses a lot of like ints for uh, file descriptors and Windows uses handles and sometimes you can infer those handle types. And then Windows also uses uh, um, uh, sal annotations, which often defines the in and out properties of like whether something's an input, if it's an output, if it expects a null terminated string. And we have a lot of things in the Microsoft code base that are very easy to kind of make a base initial pass static analysis of what surface exists due to those annotations. Um, so having a bunch of stuff like that makes it easy to get kind of an initial pass. So you can go wide, you're going really wide but shallow. And then if you want to go deeper, you want to get a human involved to start picking and putting in values that are, that are known there. Um, 
I'm enjoying the stream, but I gotta run. See you next time, Fresh Muffin. Thank you so much for stopping by. Um, all right. Okay. Yeah, for sure. Um, ultimately, I don't know what they do, right? I don't know if they have a solution to that. Um, I would hazard if they said they had an automated solution to this that solves these problems, I would say bullshit. Maybe they have a solution to, like, Zen's headers or KVM's headers or whatever they end up fuzzing in this. But ultimately, like, no, I wouldn't expect anyone to have this technique because it's a P equals NP problem. And it requires that you can solve problems to fully automate. So ultimately, it comes down to what level of information you can extract in an automated way. Yeah, if we had a solution to this, we would have claimed it in the abstract. Yeah, that would have been groundbreaking. It would have been P equals NP. It would have been, uh, or it would have been a massive database and collection of header parsing and uh, type inference and understanding of when something is used as a handle for a graphic object, like a bitmap image, or when a handle is used for a file, or when a handle is used for a device. So, like, it's hard, right? It's a lot of manual effort, right? Um, and there's there's nothing wrong with that. Um, let's see. Syscaller can work without coverage. Yeah, it can. Um, but pretty much any tool can work without coverage. You can just turn off coverage. Um, I don't think many tools are built around coverage and will uh, fundamentally not work. Okay. Applications beyond hypervisor fuzzing. I don't really care. I think we can imagine you can use it to fuzz anything, right? You can fuzz a network service. You can fuzz a syscall. You can fuzz a hypervisor. Like, yes, if you emulate an entire system, you can fuzz anything on the system. Um, to me, to me, that's obvious, but I recognize you want to be verbose in a paper because people who aren't necessarily familiar or thinking outside of the box or familiar with the space um, need to be able to understand that. Implementation details, um, basically building upon QMUPT. Once again, I'm kind of skimming here. Let me know if I missed something massive, but I'm pretty good at skimming. Um, so basically, they're building it on KVMPT. So Red Queen introduced KVMPT, which were modifications to KVM, which is a virtual machine implementation for Linux. Um, PT, they added processor trace to KVM in Red Queen, and they're building upon that. Cool. Um, fast coverage, they're using Intel PT to get that, and I think they're using libxpt or whatever the library is that parses uh, PT in a quick manner. Um, TLDR, use PT, parse the data out of PT, that's how you get coverage. Cool. Um, not saying it's not impressive by glossing over it, because it is. Um, fast snapshot reloads. Okay, unfortunately, I have to read this. Um, even though we understand what they're going to do, um, I do want to know every little detail about this. CAFL introduced KVMPT? Okay. Ah, we used the latest release of the code base. Okay, makes sense. Cool. Um, sorry about that. Um, starting each test case from a clean snapshot is important to obtain deterministic coverage results. I would not call that deterministic, to be honest, um, if you are not handling uh, timers and caching and other things. But, um, sure. I'll give you that. Um, if previous test cases can affect the coverage by, like, if I read this and you didn't say this isn't deterministic, you, you handle timers? Okay. But you said it wasn't deterministic earlier. Like, the way that I'm interpreting this from the paper is that this is a fully deterministic hypervisor that will always produce the same execution sequence every time. Um, handle time, timers, but not cache timings. Okay. Um... So basically, you inject interrupts on the exact same instruction boundary. Like, basically, if you were to preempt a task, you will always preempt it on the exact... Okay, yeah. So, like, I would say that is not handling timers, then. Because the timers are not coming in on the same instruction boundaries. We reset the timer. Yeah, okay, cool. So, basically, that's a little confusing to me, because I would interpret deterministic as deterministic, not as, like it incre increases the fidelity of the coverage results, but um, that's totally fine. Like, I, I'm, not many people are doing deterministic stuff, so it's not something I'm gonna get upset about. Um, if previous test cases can affect the coverage produced by later test cases, coverage-guided fuzzing uh, performs significantly worse. Um, let me read that again. Um, Oh, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Basically, if you don't have determinism to some level, um, it's just a mess, and you just don't know what's going on. One of the major features of Nix is the ability to restore VM snapshots many of thousand times per second. Um, 
As much as I shit on that, that is impressive because a lot of people uh, don't have stuff to do that. Um, two, implement rapid snapshot reloads. Uh, or two, implement <laughs> rapid snapshot reloads. We need to reload three components of the VM. First of all, the registration register state of the emulated CPU itself has to be reset. Secondly, we need to reset all modified pages of the memory used by the virtual machine. And lastly, the state of all devices emulated in QMU, including the hard disks, needs to be reset. We now describe the details and the mechanisms um, uh, to reset these, except for resetting the register, which is trivial. I would hope so. <laughs> it's like mem copy structure, size of structure. <laughs> Unless it's like... I don't know, sometimes you get fucky environments where like the structures are nested and in weird formats and then it's like, ugh. I think QMU does that where it uses pointers in its like CPU state and you have to like read through the pointers and copy those too. Oh, it's annoying, but yeah. <laughs> um, to create a snapshot of the virtual machine memory, we first create a snapshot file that contains a dump of the whole memory of the virtual machine. We implement a delta mechanism that allows us to create incremental updates of the snapshot file. Sweet. Um, typically, we create one full snapshot per OS type and the delta snapshots at the start of the first input. To create the snapshot, we implemented a hypercall that the agent uses to inform the fuzzer that it should create the incremental snapshot from which each test case can be started. Um, does this support uh, tree-based um, snapshots? Like, can you... Can you snapshot and then, like, take a sub-snapshot and then go back to the parent differentially? No? Okay. But that's not a big deal because I know you could add that, right? Like, you know the memory that has changed between those if you just store the, the dirty list uh, when you take that new incremental snapshot. So I know that you could add it. So um, ultimately, if you don't have a use for it, there's no reason to write that code. So I don't fault that. Um, but I think ultimately, like, looking at the, the Mario fuzzing stuff, I think that will... Um, we found it easier to just rerun everything. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think that, like, Mario-style fuzzing... Um, I would like to see that catch on where basically you like keep taking more and more snapshots and then differentially restore to those, but that really stresses the overhead you have. And um, that would really start to be difficult if you're doing hypercalls. Like literally doing a hypercall to take a snapshot, it like you probably spend more time transferring execution and context switching into the hypervisor than you actually do like traversing the memory to see what you need to save. Um, but yeah, nevertheless, uh, the, the mechanisms are there, so it's cool. Um, to quickly reset the memory of the VM, we use our own dirty page logger in KVMPT. By default, KVM already provided capabilities to log which pages have been dirtied since the last time the CPU entered the VM. However, since KVM's technique requires us to walk a large bitmap to... Oh, fuck. Yeah, so this is one thing you'll find when you do, like, dirty memory resetting stuff. Pretty much every API uses bitmaps, and you have to, like, walk a fucking bitmap. Just give me the list. Give me the list of addresses. Um, Windows does that. Um, so Windows hypervisor uh, platform does that. Also, um, Windows hypervisor platform is a great place to implement stuff like this as well. Um, they just added dirty page tracking uh, uh, and stuff. Um, I think that was from our request like a year or two ago when we were doing a, a hypervisor fuzzer thingy. Um, okay. Um, we extend KVMPT with the ability to store the addresses of dirty pages in an additional stack lake buffer. Basically, cuts down overhead, right? Yeah, you're not probing a bunch of memory. Additionally, we need to ensure that memory... Um, uh, that that memory that is changed by the devices handled by QMU PT are also reset. Um, to this end, we track a second map where VM pages modified by Q QEMU PT are also noted um, before we start the next execution. Um, each page that was changed either inside the VM or by QMU PT is reset to the original uh, content from the snapshot. So, um, is the Q QEMU state inside of... Is the device state inside of the VM, or are you tracking it with a with basically you're using um, page modification logging for the VM, and then for the Q QMU state, you'd be doing I guess you are you are inside another VM under this hypervisor, um, which uh, 
it is not what I'm used to. Like I'm used to the device state would be in the hypervisor memory and the guest state would be in the guest memory. Um, but in this case, the Q QEMU state is actually in user land inside of a VM inside of uh, running on that hypervisor, which is interesting. Unless I'm wrong in this case, but I, I would assume that's the case. No? Okay, maybe I'm wrong. Oh, I am right. Okay. Okay. Um, fast device resets. Resetting the device state is a much more involved procedure compared to resetting the memory of the VM. As noted before, QEMU manage, uh, uh, manages a multitude of devices. QEMU also provides a serialization and deserialization mechanism for each device. I'm guessing you tried that out early and you had the exact same experience that I have had. Um, yep, you immediately, I, I'm guessing you're not using that at the end here, <laughs> which is used to store snapshots of running VMs to the disk. Each device emulator provides a specification for its state in form of a, sp uh, um, in form of a specific data structure. QMU iterates this data structure to identify fields, integers, arrays, and so on. During serialization, these fields get converted to a JSON string, which then can be loaded during ser deserialization. The whole process is painfully slow, but ensures that VM snapshots can be loaded even on different machines, where the compiler may change the in-memory layout. To increase the performance, we mostly ignore these device uh, structure specifications, Instead, we log all writes one, uh, during this process and obtain a list of all memory used by the devices. Using this list, we can now reset the device's memory uh, from our snapshot with a series of calls to memcopy. It should be noted that a small subset of devices cannot be reset like this, as they require to run some custom code after each reset? What? What? Oh, you're keeping, you're not resetting QEMU itself. You are resetting only the, the devices of QEMU. Because if you reset the entirety of QEMU, you would reset the state of those things as well. Um, we manually identified those devices in QEMU PT and call the original deserialization routine. Oh. Yeah, that's going to be tough. Um, note that physical hardware, uh, which is used by the guest via pass-through, cannot be reset, is not passable, uh, possible to access the state stored in real hardware. Yeah, I think that's where I get a big advantage for overhead, or, like, I'm not doing devices, but I would, um, in that I would implement the devices in a way that, A, they are, like, linearly allocated in memory, and I can reset them as a nice block. Um, but the other thing is I wouldn't have other state that I would have to reinitialize, right? Um, but once again, uh, actually, well, I did this. I did this for box, right? So for box, um, I have a fully deterministic emulator that I wrote for Microsoft uh, for box called TKO Fuzz. It's been mentioned a couple times. Um, but ultimately, what I do is I wrote a uh, I wrote a Linux emulator, right? So in user space, I wrote an emulator that emulates Linux syscalls. I then built Box with a custom muscle, um, libc, uh, that instead of using the syscall instruction, called it like an indirect address or something that I filled in. And then that means that Box would actually call into me um, when it did syscalls. And basically, uh, by doing this, it means that Box had no access to external data. It couldn't get a clock from the... Um, OS, like in theory, it could RDTSC, but it doesn't, right? There were no instances of that instruction, so it didn't matter. Um, but ultimately, the snapshots that I have uh, for TKO fuzz are actually the entirety of box. Um, it's, it's all of the memory box has ever mmapped or alloced or burked or anything um, and its register state. What's really cool about this is that is portable between operating systems, I can take a box snapshot, um, which is the literal box execution environment, and then bring it to OS X or bring it to Windows or bring it to Linux, doesn't matter. Um, and then just as long as I map it at the same address, because it's just one big blob of memory, I can continue execution. Um, it also means I can mmap it in and do a bunch of stuff there, uh, which is neat. So, yeah, good luck doing that for QMU. It would totally work with QMU. There's no reason it wouldn't work with QMU. It's the exact same logic. Um, 
Basically, you isolate all ability for it to access the host. And if you do that, then you don't care about if it's deterministic or not, or how structures are laid out in memory, because the QEMU implementation is part of the snapshot. Um, but yeah, that's what we did. Um, and it actually worked really well, because the guest register state, the, the guest, the memory, the physical memory, the device states, the box stack, globals, doesn't matter. Literally everything was just in one opaque blob. Um, so yeah, that was uh, one approach to do it. If you don't care about KVM, sure, it still works the same way. Um, still works the same way. Fast, fast disk reset. QMU handles hard disk differently from other devices. Yes, very slowly. Um, as their state is very large, potentially larger than the available memory. The guest's hard disk content is stored on the host hard disk called in a so-called QCO format. I hope you're not using that. Um, to ensure we can handle targets uh, that write files to hard disk, we need to make our own overlay layer on top of QCO. Okay, so you make your own copy on write layer. During the execution, we create a hash map that stores the content of modified sectors. This hash map is stored in memory and uses a fixed set of buffer of pages. Each read access uh, to the disk image is first checked against the hash map and then against the QCOW. Okay, sweet. Makes sense. Yeah, no problem. Um, do you have a caching layer in there where you also cache things that came from the QCOW? Because QCOWs are slow. Um, uh, we place an upper limit on the number of sectors written to... Okay, basically, yeah. You cut down on the memory use. Um, resetting the disk image is uh, then as easy as zeroing out the small hash map. So is there a reason why... Um, is there a reason why you don't convert the QCOW into an image, like a flat image, and then just memory map that image in, and then just throw that in part of your like dev device reset or memory resets, and just pull it together? Um, but I think that would, that would be a speed up too. Um, obviously that's, ah, I don't think that's too hard, but that also, I mean, that requires you're on 64 bit and can map in a, a virtually map in a whole hard drive, but that's trivial. Like that's not hard to do. So that's not a big deal. Um, I'm learning a lot from these streams. Absolutely. I'm glad you're enjoying it. Fumio. Thank you so much for the two months. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Good to see you coming back. All right. Um, okay, so nested hypervisor communication. Yeah, I think this is where things are going to get really slow and out of control of um, what you can do, right? If you're, this is one of the reasons I don't like building on existing solutions. Um, this transition, right, you have to do a hyper call. You have to do a VM call, uh, which is then going to cause a trap, which is then going to call, cause your register state of your VM to get saved. And then it's going to cause, like, basically a context switch, probably into, like, some C code, because they probably implement that in assembly where they initially land. They probably convert it to, like, a generic architecture agnostic register structure that's not VTX specific. And then they hand execution to you, and you do your thing, and then you have to undo the whole thing and come back. And that, that VM call is probably more expensive than my entire VM entry and VM exit of entering the guest. Um, so basically that's going to like double the transactional cost of almost everything. And it sucks. Like VM calls look cheap, but they're not, they're, they're very expensive. Um, but once again, you don't have a great way around it unless you put everything in the hypervisor itself, which I recommend you do. <laughs> um, if a special value is placed in the racks register by the guest, the hypercall request is handled by KVM PT. Otherwise it is passed to the target hypervisor. Um, to set up a shared memory mapping between the host and the uh, and the agent OS, um, we need to allocate a memory region in L2 first. So basically, you you map in uh, probably some data structures or like fuzz inputs and stuff that you literally alias in, so you don't even have to copy them. Um, using our hypercall interface, we pass all physical addresses of our allocated memory region to the host by executing a special hypercall. The host translates all guest physical addresses to host physical addresses and creates a shared memory mapping. Uh, visualization of this procedure is given in figure three. Okay. Um, so that's really neat. Uh, good for perf. Uh, one negative to that, which is not something that I even think this paper uh, considers, um, is that this is basically... Um, this is um, 
Like, this basically makes it so you can't, um, you can't use this to fuzz, like, malicious or sensitive binaries that may be looking for modifications of the system um, because you can observe uh, those modifications. Um, love, would lo still would like to see a perf comparison against TKO. I mean, TKO was not designed for perf. It wasn't. It runs at like 50 million instructions a second. Um, but it provides infinite breakpoints, perfect taint tracking, taint that allows you to see when memory transacts into a device and out of a device. It supports emulation of Hyper-V and nested verts, and it supports emulation of basically anything that runs on x86, including real mode, including long mode, protected mode, unreal mode, it doesn't matter. Um, that's why TKO exists, because it works generically on everything. And while this works generically, I'm kind of skeptical that this works with 16-bit applications and 32-bit applications and DOS and maybe Hyper-V out of the box, depending on if KVM supports that. But I think it does, uh, but Hyper-V is a bitch to run. Um, but yeah, it does since recently, nice, but yeah. No, TKO was written because it's easy to work with. Um, this is not easy to work with. Sorry. Like, as much as you might think this is easy to work with, it is not. Uh, TKO, all of the code is in Rust and in C. You don't have to do any assembly. You don't have to write... Everything is in user space. You have no kernel code. You have no hyper calls. You have no aliasing of memory. You have no working with page tables. You have no working with a hypervisor. You can run it on a machine without a hypervisor. You can run it in Azure when you don't have access to doing nested vert. There were a lot of decisions that went into doing that. Um, but yeah. All right. Um, but yeah, TKO was not designed for perf. Also, TKO was written in two weeks by me. So that also was a benefit. It didn't take multiple people months of work and it didn't require any experts. It just, I just wrote some code. Um, so yeah, kind of hard to beat that. It's also fully deterministic. Um, and determinism is important because we have 30 minute fuzz cases that we run inside of TKO and we cannot have timer interrupts coming on different boundaries because that would make a lot of bugs useless. Um, but yeah. And didn't require experts. Yeah, I mean, it, it didn't require a team. It was just a short little thing. I mean, eventually a team got made out of it to add some features, which were mainly hooks into Windows, but it was designed to be developed quickly to fill a hole that didn't exist and still doesn't exist. There is no tool that can match the capabilities of TKO right now. None. There is no fully deterministic system level emulator that has full taint tracking through hardware devices. There's nothing, nothing. So um, until you fulfill that role, I don't really care about uh, which one's faster because um, it's, not a, it's not a perf competition. Um, what's TKO? Uh, TKO Fuzz is a tool I wrote at Microsoft that is, it's a fully deterministic system level emulator with full taint and all sorts of stuff. Um, it's slow as shit but it was designed to be uh, easily used in basically all of the environments we needed to deploy in, which included environments where we couldn't create a hypervisor. Is it written in Rust? Yes, it is. Is it open source? It is not. Um, but yeah, it's written in Rust. It was actually one of the first projects. Um, honestly, I think more impactful than the bugs TKO has found is the adoption of Rust at Microsoft um, because that was kind of like two years before Microsoft had like, was really doing any Rust stuff. And it meant that a couple members of the security team immediately started getting Rust experience, which was really useful for like future um, interactions, which actually was uh, really cool. So, but it has found some cool bugs. It's found uh, Windows IP stack remotes, uh, RDP remotes, um, TCP remotes, SMB remotes, um, Hyper-V bug, uh, yeah, Hyper-V bugs, Azure bugs, um, basically everything. Basically every critical surface, um, it has found bugs in. So it's been fantastic. Does it do deterministic task sw switching then? Yes. Um, it will run the exact same instructions and exact same register state every time. So if you are to run the exact same input through, you will get the exact same register trace. Doesn't matter if you run it for a decade, you will get the exact same result. It is 
unable to get access to any entropy. Um, it doesn't exist. There is no way for it to get entropy, and thus it will run indefinitely deterministically, fully. Uh, devices, interrupts, timers, task switches, does not matter. Everything is deterministic to the instruction. Not a single bit of memory would be different between two execution uh, cases. Um, how does the TCP stack still have bugs? I have no idea. <laughs> um, that was kind of surprising to all of us, to be honest. Is there any article that talks about the design of TKO? There is not, I don't think. I've done some TKO dev before. Can you use it to fuzz race conditions, though? Yes, because you can, since everything's determin deterministic, you can deterministically slide in instruction boundaries, too. So you can deterministically cause the next iteration. So basically, same input. Replay the input. Okay, next time, I want thread number two to start one instruction earlier, and then one instruction later, and one instruction later, and one instruction later. Or I want it to start the next time, like, on the instruction where it accesses something that is aliased between the two threads. Um, so yes, it's even better for that. Um, having full determinism is kind of, in my opinion, required if you want to find race conditions that are a couple instructions wide, because you can deterministically make sure that you slide and find that window. It's, it's awesome. I'm, I, I highly, um, once again, another reason why I don't care about the perf of TKO, that, that, infinite read-write breakpoints, infinite tra taint tracking through devices, like, you write a device to a network card DMA buffer, and then the network card DMAs that into some other memory, and then that memory ends up getting cached out uh, and, and paged out to disk, and then later something accesses it, that taint information is still propagated. You still know that that was part of your user input uh, and affected by user input. Um, so yeah, I can't say I care about performance when I have infinite intros introspection into everything and full determinism and the ability to fuzz for race conditions that are one instruction wide. Um, so those are the decisions that went into TKO. And yeah, it's, uh, it's about a 50 to 100x slowdown from native execution. But I don't care because we can just spin it up on 10,000 cores. Um, Getting that, getting full determinism in a hypervisor is very difficult. I do think it's possible uh, with, um, I do think it's possible with instruction or branch counts uh, perf counters, um, but a lot of research needs to go into that because that's not something defined, that's undefined behavior, so you would have to basically try to define that behavior of the processor and make it reliable. So, um... How much of the 100x is the emulation? Is the next biggest perf hit the taint tracking? I think the taint tracking is a 5x overhead, um, but that's typically just not on. Like, if you're not using it, you just don't turn it on. So, but yeah. But typically, you're not, in, in fuzzing world, you're typically not bottlenecking on the number of cases you can get a second. Um, you can... The more introspection you can get, the better, right? AFL got better when they added code coverage. And then AFL got better when they added compare coverage. And AFL got better when they added mem copy hooks. And they add, it got better when they added mem compare hooks, right? Pretty much all of the major adva and advancements that have ever been made in fuzzers are instrumentation. It's never like perf or mutation strategies. It's always just massive improvements in instrumentation, right? And we see this in papers, right? Not this paper in, sp uh, in particular, but a lot of papers are like, oh, we got 2% more coverage or we got 3% more coverage than AFL. Who fucking cares? And then like three years later, Clang, without making a paper, without making a big scene about it, adds a new like hook into their stuff. And now everything gets a 50% increase. And then it continues on and on. So like people are basically making fuzzers that corrupt things slightly better, which doesn't fucking matter. And then every couple of years, we get a major new thing integrated into Clang or LVM or whatever that gives us a new mechanism for feedback. And then we get a huge improvement. It's no surprise. Like the quality of the fuzz cases and generic fuzzers and mutation just is it's not the bottleneck in fuzzing at all it just isn't it might hold you over on research grants but like the way that you flip bits in an input is not the fucking bottleneck in security research it's so far from the bottleneck um 
Not to say it isn't valuable, it's just probably the least valuable thing you could be working on in security. Um, on the next VM entry transition, uh, from the target hypervisor to the agent OS, the snapshot will be created by QMUPT. Um, it's illustrated in here. OK, so yeah, there are a lot of context switches here, right? This is a lot of context switches. Um, so um, like each one of these is more expensive than basically my entire VM reset for, n for no dirty pages, right? So if you're wondering whether or not the million can be done with devices, I would hazard absolutely yes, it can, right? So like um, generating the input is a big part of the time. Who cares? I don't care about that. The IOCTAL is like 500 cycles just to get into the kernel. The, uh, the VM call and setting up with those buffers and basically finding the right thing that's reserved that you can pass it on to the hypervisor, that's going to be another 500 to 1,000 cycles. Coming back is going to be another 500 cycles. And also, this execute payload also includes uh, VM exits. I guess that's this, this VM exit. Ex I see. You like execute the payload. You return back from the agent. You enable PT. You handle a request. You get a VM entry request. You like these transitions are are very expensive, right? Um, like I would say, by the time you get to this stage, I probably could have reset the VM, right? Um, that being said, if you actually do something, then that, that overhead doesn't matter, right? If you're not actually like jumping between snapshots, the overhead doesn't really matter, so who cares? Um, but that's just my bread and butter, so that's what I care about. Um, okay, so this is talking about how they implement the uh, byte code and the basically how they type these structures. This is interesting to me, um, but I don't really care about the specifics, mainly just for uh, speed of reading through um, this paper. Um, if people are interested in how they actually design and represent these things, uh, go ahead. Um, but yeah, basically, they're going to like compile an efficient um, representation of these structures, which makes sense. Uh, rendered on a Xeon Gold, a 6230 machine, 40 physical cores, 192 gigs of RAM, as well as an SSD. Um, I'm glad you actually gave the CPU uh, model, because that lets me know what the microarchitecture is. Um, did not use hyperthreading? Why not? We pinned each fuzzer to one physical core and did not use hyperthreading. I feel like you should be using hyperthreading. Um, each experiment was repeated 10 times to obtain statistically significant results. Sure. Um, we targeted QMU 5.0.0 and Beehive. Okay, so Beehive is going to be easy to find bugs in. It's free BSD code, um, which is pretty easy to find bugs in. And they're typically not very security concerned. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if most of the bugs that were found were in Beehive. Uh, so we'll go look at that. Shade. Hey, I worked on FreeBSD for a long time, and I'm a big fan of it, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to lie. It's not great quality code. <laughs> um... Great documentation, though, and great comments, but not the best code quality. We repeat the Hypercube experiments, blah, 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 fuzzing the device simulators, uh, fuzzing stuff for 24 hours. Once again, arbitrary deadlines, like standard. Um, but yeah, what else are you going to do? We have no way to benchmark these things. Um, on more complex devices, the advantages of coverage-guided fuzzing begin the show. Not surprised. The less you understand or the more complex things are, the more you get. Okay, here's what I kind of care about. It's looking at some of these graphs. Um, so we've got Nick's Legacy against Hypercube. So this is an older version of Nick's. And we can see that it's a little behind Hypercube, a little up in front of Hypercube, and maybe not statistically significant. Same thing here, comparable, comparable. Basically the same, right? Basically basically the same. Um, this is in the time domain. So this is factoring in the performance improvements or loss of performance from Nix and or Hypercube. I don't know which one is faster or slower. Unfortunately, this is why I don't like time-based graphs. And it's why I don't like logarithmic or non-logarithmic time-based graphs. Because once again, I can't see anything that's happening at the start of the fuzz case. I just see a flat line and all these diagrams, which means nothing to me. So you might as well just print a data point that's the end part of the graph. Because what 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 is this graph telling me? Like nothing. Like uh, like maybe there's a little bit of gap where it's behind on the first four hours, but then it's like 
I it tells me nothing. Just give me the result, right? I just don't care in that case. And we, we will have the results, I think. Um, but like the graph over time here is just useless if you're not actually going to show it in a way that I can see signal other than PCNet, which just had a lot of coverage. Um, OK. Let's see here. Uh, and once again, that's not even a criticism of the paper. It's like, why would you as a researcher not want to see better data? Like, why wouldn't you want to see better information? Like, I don't even care about what you're presenting to the customer of this paper, but like, why wouldn't, why wouldn't you yourself want to view the data? Right? This is, these are all perfect places to use log scale. And I know we've had that debate before, but I just can't possibly imagine the argument against log scale x axis. It, it, it makes no sense. All of these graphs, you'd actually see what happened at the start um, instead of just this flat line, which basically tells me these fuzzers are identical. And once again, since it's in the time domain and not in the iterations domain, um, Nick's legacy could be the worst fuzzer in the world. It has terrible mutation strategies, but it runs 10 billion times faster than Hypercube. And then it's like, okay, do I care? Um, so, anyways, we'll keep going. Um, all right. Okay. So, MMIO accesses. Yep, yep, yep. Looks good. And then, uh, behavior of Hypercube uh, and our more detailed uh, specification. These results can be found in figure five. Um, as the experiment results show, using more detailed specifications drastically increases the performance of the fuzzer. Um, while in the previous experiment, coverage guidance uh, on helped in the long term, and Hypercube dominated for the first hour of fuzzing. Here we can see that such specifications are showing, showing drastic improvements in performance from the first moment on. I'm assuming in this place, Point. performance has nothing to do with the actual speed of execution. It is the uh, amount of coverage, coverage obtained um, because uh, the more detailed your specifications are, the slower your fuzzer is going to get because the deeper it's going to get. So like perf-wise, it will get slower. Um, to further confirm the claim that coverage guidance is in fact helpful, uh, we perform a second experiment comparing these coverage-guided and non-coverage-guided fuzzing uh, with more detailed specifications. Um, let's see. That's the point. That's the point of what? The time, the time factoring in the performance. Um, okay. Oh, legacy. Okay. Well, we'll keep going. Um, Thus, we compare a blinded version of Nix with the normal coverage guided version of Nix. This allows us to specifically identify. Okay, so it's the non coverage one. Um. These results are also shown in figure five. As we can see, without code coverage, the complex inner uh, specifications added very little coverage. Okay, let's see. Um, so we've got VDF, Hypercube, um, and then Nix. I don't know what percent coverage is. Um, that kind of like means nothing to me. I don't, I don't know. Since one of these columns is not always at 100%, I don't know what that's relative to. Um, so I'm not 100% sure uh, what that means. Um, percent of GCOV branches, OK. And I'm assuming you've normalized that it's the exact same code and exact same metric of coverage for all of these. And you're not measuring like edges versus branches versus blocks. Um, uh, OK. Guessing you do like the, the um, fuzz bench where you rerun it through. VDF is an open source. So how are you comparing the coverage results? Or are you? Are you just, when you get an input, then you pass it through into Nix? Because basically, if these aren't all the exact same coverage things, I don't even give a, f OK, they're, they're reported results. So here's what I have to do, unfortunately. I don't give a shit. None of those results mean anything to me because they have different me uh, mechanisms of reporting. So to me, I can't do anything with that information. So it's a completely useless table. Um, 
fucking sucks, but that's how it goes, right? If, if it's a different mechanism of reporting coverage, I'm not comparing two things. Sorry, I just won't. I, that, that's, that is unacceptable to me. Um, all right, then we have percent branches found over time. Um, Nick Spec, Nick's Legacy, and Hypercube. I'm assuming that Hypercube, you're doing maybe the same things. I, I mean, if Hypercube and Nix and VDF all have different things, then all of these graphs are useless and this entire paper is useless to me. Sorry, seriously, seriously. If you have not normalized the coverage reporting mechanism between all of these, this entire paper is useless at this point. Like, I can't compare these. I can't at all. Like, you can't, you can't show me statistical significance of two different metrics, right? Because they're different metrics. Um, Hypercube and Nix are measured the same. Okay, that's what I was expecting, so I'm going to ignore the other one. Hypercube and Nix, I'm happy with that. Okay, that's kind of what I thought. Um, but yeah, if they're different, I can't compare them, right? VDF is crap? Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> I don't know, right? There's just no way to measure it. I mean, technically, you could try to, like, replay it back into what you do, but that would require reversing of it, and yeah, I understand why that's not been done. Um... Okay, so we've got uh, spec, legacy, and hypercube. Okay, so we can kind of compare all these. Obviously, it's outperforming. Great, good to see. Obviously, um, this is one of the issues with papers is selection bias. This paper wouldn't exist unless this graph showed this, right? If, if this graph weren't better, if it weren't better than existing solutions, this paper wouldn't exist at all. Um, so that's one thing I, I really don't like about a lot of academia, although it would probably just keep turning or overfitting. I'm not saying you're overfitting here, but let's be honest, people p hack. Um, so, okay. For realistic workloads, our snapshot reloads are multiple of orders of magnitudes faster than QMU's internal snapshot restoration mechanism. Cool, not a surprise. QMU's snapshot mechanism is not meant for resetting, it's meant for restoring, if that makes sense. Um, we were able to perform about 60% as many uh, test cases as compared to AFL's fork server. Not surprised, AFL's fork server is slow as shit. Um, while obtaining similar performance, Nix reloads uh, uh, perform a lot more tasks than the fork server. Um, sure, uh, we observed that when the target only dirties 10 pages, uh, we reload uh, almost 100 pages in the kernel. Uh, we also reset all of the devices state, including hard disks. This also shows up in the number of pages reloaded. Um, oh, not open source? They never published it? Oh, yeah. Then, yeah, then I, yeah, I really don't care about those results then. Um... When using Nix in, an, in offline experiments, we, reserve, uh, we observe that fuzzing programs like Bash with AFL is uh, very hard. Great care has to be taken to ensure um, uh, script interpreters do not overwrite or remove any relevant files. Yep. Uh, similarly, they uh, do tend to quickly fill up the disk with junk. All of these issues are mitigated with the snapshot restoration. Yes, of course. New vulnerabilities. Um, what have we got? We evaluated various devices on... Uh, okay. Beehive, QMU, okay, no surprise, everything looks good here. Oh yeah, here's, here's the thing that I'm interested in. So basically when I see 10 to the zero, um, I interpret that as one dirty page or maybe zero dirty pages. Um, yeah, at which point, yeah, I think there's room for a 100x improvement at this side of the graph. But obviously once you get here, you're bottlenecking on literally mem copying memory. So it doesn't matter. If you're not doing more than this many fuzz cases a second, then there, it doesn't matter. Um, 10 to the zero is, is one, yes, but there's a chance that that was a zero or something. So, um, but yeah. Okay, and then uh, bugs. Not too surprised here. Um, look, oh, look what we found. Most of the bugs are in Beehive. Like, not too surprised here. Um, obviously, aborts and QMU, a lot of times aborts just don't get reported or even fixed. People like don't even bother or don't even build uh, with, a, uh, with a build where those actually do anything. Although, I think if these are actual aborts, then they're probably in by default and it's not a debug build. Um, but yeah, this looks pretty good. Uh, good results. Obviously, Beehive, not surprised. Beehive's gonna, gonna have a shit ton of bugs. I don't think anyone has fuzzed it, so I'm not surprised. 
um, log scale here. Yeah, this one's log scale, which makes sense. Um, but yeah. Zero is far to the left. I mean, zero doesn't exist on a log scale graph, but sometimes people will put in zero at one um, kind of as an example, right? So um, let's see here. Um, case study. Okay, this is talking through the bugs. I don't really care, to be honest. Um, related work. Um, let's see. Oh, folk. Yeah, I search for myself in here. That's what I do in papers. See? See, I'm selfish. Um, I use a similar mechanism. However, oh, yep, there it is. There's the standard. Um, however, it doesn't implement emulated devices, and thus, um, yeah, there's no way the performance could even remotely uh, be that fast. Um, okay. Yeah, everything looks pretty good here. So ultimately, um, I think it's a really good paper. Like, um, once again, I'm not impressed with the concept, right? Um, and the reason I'm not impressed with the concept is because I've been doing this for eight years, right? I've been doing hypervisor-based fuzzing with dirty page snapshotting uh, for eight years. And I have videos going back six or seven years where I talk about the importance of dirty bit tracking and traversing that and resetting differentially and optimizing the way that you handle device states. Um, so to me, in in the realm of not this paper, but in the realm of the industry, um, this paper is not impressive at all to me, mainly because it's obvious, right? It's obvious that this should have been done. It should have been done in 2010. It should have been done in 2006 when we got the first processors with VTX. Um, and I know that people have done this since 2006 when VTX got implemented. But ultimately, putting that aside, that's not a dig on the researchers or the paper or the university. That's a dig on the industry. The paper itself, I love it. This is, this is exactly, when I say we should have done this 14 years ago, it's not that this, these people should have come up with these things because they probably weren't even in school. They were probably still in like high school, right? It's that this is obvious and, and What's frustrating to me is that saying that this is obvious, I think will come off as an insult to the authors, but it's not. It's an insult to the industry for not doing this first. The fact that this is one of the first papers that actually talks about differentially restoring snapshots is sad, right? And it's, once again, the paper is impressive. The ideas are here. This is what I was afraid of in like 2014. I remember, so I wrote Fulkervisor when? 2013, 2014. And I remember in like 2015, I think I gave a talk on hypervisor-based fuzzing. And I remember I gave that talk because I was so scared that like any day now, someone was going to release a hypervisor-based fuzzer and like my one trick pony was going to just be gone because someone else would do it and it would just become a universal thing that everyone does because it's so fucking obvious. Like, okay, you wanna fuzz a whole system. Okay, how do you run a whole system? A hypervisor or an emulator. Okay, let's go the other route. Let's say, how do you run a whole system in a way that you can gather instrumentation? Oh, an emulator. Okay, is there anything that's been invented in the past 15 years or more specifically in computer architecture for like, Decades, but in Intel, is there anything that's been added to make emulation faster? Yes? Oh, there is? Should we use that to fuzz? Yes! Wow! Shit! We made it! Like, the fact that it took so long was fucking sad. Um, that being said, we've seen a couple things um, this year in this regard. Uh, obviously, this paper talks about it. Um, once again, I think it's a fantastic paper, but I think everything in it is pretty obvious. Like. If you were to task someone with writing a high performance fuzzing environment, I think they would find out about the dirty bit because you would have to end up walking a page table at some point to do a translation and you'd be like, shit, there's a dirty bit in here. That sounds useful. Um, but next, the way that the, uh, the data is stored for doing the, the, um, the fuzz cases itself is kind of what you have to do for like an API based fuzzer. I like that they model it after Rust and I think those things are improvements which are fantastic. Um, so that is super cool to me as well. 
Um, but yeah, ultimately, um, I wish this came out earlier, but I think it's a really good paper. Like, every, like, everything in here is basically something I have seen done before, and that's not a bad thing. That's actually a good thing. It means that these things, um, these things are the right things to do, right? I've seen tools that do this dating back to 2006, and they're actively maintained. Why? Because it's a good idea. It's a good way to do things, and I, I greatly appreciate that. Um, but yeah, so I think it's, I think it's a really good paper, um, and I'd love for this to become more of a thing. Um, I do think snapshot fuzzing is exceptionally hard to grasp. I think it's a lot of work to understand and to implement. Um, or not even implement, but even use. Um, so really what we need in the industry is uh, an open source or closed source, I don't even give a shit, um, a hypervisor that's designed for fuzzing that has good hooks into Linux and Windows and you can like GDB stub it, you can WinBag stub it, it's deterministic or not, it has taint tracking support, you can turn coverage on and off, you can plug in your own um, uh, harnesses and your own mechanisms for actually instrumenting and modifying the uh, target under test. Um, and that's what we need. Um, so, um, I don't know. Like, those things, to me, are where this industry needs to go. And I really don't see it happening. Because I think this paper is going to be a paper that's going to be referenced a bunch, but no one's ever going to use it. Even if it gets open source. Because it's just... It's not easy to use stuff like this. It's very difficult setting up places to snapshots, um, taking snapshots, putting breakpoints on things. Um, when you are doing introspection from a hypervisor, you don't have symbols. You don't know what processes are. You don't know what thread stacks are. You don't know what interrupts are. You, you are looking literally at like physical memory and maybe the current CR3's virtual memory, but you have to find out information about the host, to find where the task list is, to figure out where different structures are, to figure out where CR3s for different processes are, and you have to figure out where the like th thread lists are, and the, the process lists, and the credential lists, and the device states, and like all of that information. Um, I don't know if it's ever going to become a common way of fuzzing. I really don't. I do think it's the correct way to fuzz, but I don't know if um, those hurdles will ever be surpassed for an average user. I think it's just too hard to use. Um, um, but yeah. Anyways, no, I think this is really good. So... Thank you so much for this, Cornelius. I don't know if the other authors are in chat, but this is a great paper. Um, I wish it came sooner. Sooner, I did kind of see it coming. Um, we've got some other work. I don't know if it, uh, the Intel stuff is mentioned. Um, Intel's hypervisor that they're working on for fuzzing as well, whatever they call that, I forget. Um, I don't see that mentioned. So uh, what is it, the Intel? Fuzzing hypervisor. Um, uh, not barbervisor, but barbervisor also came out this year, uh, which kind of frustrated me. Sorry. Um, what the fuck was. Um, what did Intel call it? Intel had some, like, hypervisor that they used for fuzzing, right? Um, Intel, GitHub. Probably not going to be able to find it on here. Ah, yes, the kernel fuzzer for Zen project. Yes, this one. Um, yeah. So, like, we've seen this. Um, I, I'm sure this does differential restores as well. Now, they have a 22-step guide into how to use it. Um, Kind of standard shit, once again, using AFL for no reason. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Why did Barbervisor frustrate you? Um, because I didn't really get a mention, and I basically helped the developer through the entire process of it. Um, and basically, um, 
allegedly is like PR basically scrubbed all the references to my stuff. Um, but basically that uh, hypervisor was about 60% of my code and the inspiration and the design behind it was all of my ideas. Um, and yeah, I got like, I think I got a mention of like, we built on the sushi roll kernel or we built on the orange slice kernel or something like that. Um, so yeah, really frustrating to me. Um, but ultimately, um, Barb Revisor had been under development for like four years, right? It was like um, he saw some of my early Folk Revisor stuff and saw some of my early streams and asked me questions and I answered a bunch of questions and kind of helped him out with resetting and OS dev and all sorts of things. And then it gets released and it like, yeah. So kind of frustrating. The underlying, the underlying kernel is orange sliced by Brandon Folk, yeah. And like... Um, there were some like legal issues there, which don't really matter to me because I don't care, but like my license that I had on Orange Slice was deleted and replaced with a different incompatible license, um, replaced with like Cisco Talus branding and copyright and all sorts of shit. Like, you can miss me with that shit. Sorry. Um, but yeah. What's the state of Orange Slice? Orange Slice was very temporary. Uh, Orange Slice was just kind of a, an a example. It was kind of just like my first test of trying to do um, OS development on stream. And it was like, meh. Um, but, oh well. Like, um, that one I didn't really plan to continue. Uh, I would maybe continue Chocolate Milk. Um, but Chocolate Milk um, is basically on the table because I plan to write a different operating system. Um, I like having the uh, separate virtual address spaces for each core that I did in Sushi Roll. Uh, it allows you to basically um, access the page table without a lock, and you can access the page table without having to do TLB shootdowns. Um, so that would be one thing I'd be curious about here uh, is like scaling. Basically, like how this scales with cores. That's not mentioned here, and it's something that's important to me. Um, getting something like this to work fast on a single core is really easy. Getting something like this to work fast on multiple cores, where you're atomically sharing input databases that are mapped into multiple places and are aliased, um, and basically you have to make copies for different NUMA nodes because you have different processors and you bottleneck on memory bandwidth being slow on one core versus another. Um, those things are really difficult. Um, and I kind of suspect that uh, those problems haven't been solved. Um, like, it's, it's tough, to be honest. So, but yeah, ultimately, uh, I think it's a really good paper. So I'm, I know, like, I'm always harsh with these things, and I know I get frustrated when I'm looking at data that is uncomparable, but I think you understand my frustration. Um, like, there's some optimizations for NUMA cores, yeah. Yeah, I basically, like, had to make copies of the VM image that, the, like, the master image that I would reset to. I had to make a copy of that for every NUMA node, because if I did not, um, basically, number of NUMA nodes minus one over NUMA nodes percent of cores uh, would basically be half the speed of everything else. Um, but, yeah, those are, uh, those are really hard problems, to be honest. So... But ultimately, there's, there's only so much performance you're going to be able to eke out of an existing environment like KVM that's not designed to do quick resets. Um, you can add those things in eventually, but uh, like QMU device state is not stored in a way that's like uh, clean. I don't know if... Um, I don't know if it's mentioned in here. I know I skimmed a couple sections, but um, I don't think anything said that the uh, QMU device state... Uh, was sequentially allocated, and thus QMU could have like each device basically just randomly got an allocation on random pages, and you end up restoring you know 10 pages worth of data, even though it's only like a couple hundred bytes, and you could fit that all on one page. Okay, did the allocator hook stuff good? Okay, yeah. Um, basically, you want to make sure that the device state is as, as batched as possible. Didn't really work. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that's one reason why I don't, I like building things from scratch because if I design, if I wrote device emulation for a fuzzing hypervisor, uh, I would design it with resetting in mind and like 
saving data in ways that uh, keeps everything like nice and linearly contiguous. Um, maybe even have an allocator that is capable of like shuffling things around um, to basically like see, oh, the E1000 driver and the hard drive controller always have uh, device state changes, but the floppy controller is rarely done. And make sure that the ones that are getting reset are on the same page. Um, stuff like that I think would be really cool, but um, there are devices that really fucked up memory. Yeah. Yeah, because they have, like, pointers and structures and stuff. And that's why, like, yeah, it, that's that's where you basically are capped um, at the performance properties of the software that you are using. Um, unless you rewrite it, right, of course. So, um, and that's how I'm able to get performance, is I avoid those things. They randomly alias. Yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> that sounds about right. So, hell yeah. I hope that wasn't too harsh. I think it's a great paper. Um, I wish it came sooner. I'm glad it's finally here, though. So, uh, I hope the source is good. I hope this is done in a clean way that's not, like, super tied to a specific uh, chip or KVM version, and it's a, a little bit portable. Because if it's a little bit portable, then hopefully um, other people can adopt it, and we can build stuff on it. Had a lot of fun? Absolutely, dude. Like, this stuff's really cool and really impressive. Like, I don't... I don't understand why this hasn't been done before. I don't understand why this wasn't the progression. Like, this is pretty obvious that you are going to be the one who did this, or, I mean, there are more people on the paper. I'm just speaking to you because you're in chat. Um, but, like, it was pretty obvious this was going to happen uh, once we started seeing some more, like, shared memory hypervisory things and, like, the Mario stuff, and uh, which was IJ, I, I, John? I, 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 John, however you want to pronounce that. Um, uh, and then, like, before there, that, there were some, like, precursors, like, it was pretty obvious that you were gonna find this, right? Like, it's, it's, um, the, the progression started there, and it's something that I hadn't seen in a lot of the security industry, like, I knew this was gonna happen this year, um, because, the security industry, like, was basically, you know, making their AFL modifications and making their bit flippers one bit better every day. And then, like, you came out with a lot of this stuff with uh, Mario and some earlier hypervisor stuff and even KF KAFL. Actually, I think the first thing that tipped me off to this eventually happening was the uh, PT usage. Um, and especially the skepticism of the performance of the Intel PT library, which... Um, I think there's a, a video of me asking a question to, like, Richard Johnson in, like, 2015 or 2016 uh, when he was talking about using PT, where I literally asked, like, what's the overhead of PT? And then he gave me the bullshit answer of, like, oh, it's, like, 1% to 2%. It's like, no, 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 no. Not what is the runtime overhead. What is the overhead when you include the fact that you have to process this trace? Um, and I don't think I really got an answer there. Um, mainly because I, I don't know if he knew. Um, honestly, like, at the time, that was kind of weird to me, but after reading a lot of papers, like, a lot of people don't know the performance properties of their stuff, right? Papers which claim low overhead, but then we go and, like, take their source and build and run it, and we can see that it's, like, 90% overhead, and it's, like, how did you literally never measure your overhead before making a claim that you have, like, novelly low overhead? Um, but yeah, uh... Basically, I saw the initial performance of the Intel PT library, and I knew that it sucked, um, but I also knew that it was probably possible to solve, and then, of course, we saw that with XPT solving that. Um, so let's see. Um, LibXDC. Sorry, I, like, keep for, yeah. I don't know what I'm saying, but yeah, LibXDC. Yeah, yeah. We are talking about the same thing. Um, just read the Barber Pfizer blog. No mention of you. Uh, sounds like you wrote it from scratch. Um, yeah, I mean, don't be mean to him. I, like, rumor is, like, I talked to him afterwards, and basically the rumor is, like, PR scrubbed it because they wanted to make it sound as internal as possible. Um, I don't know. I don't know. But, yeah, I don't, I don't think it's his fault. And, like, I'll give him, I'll give him the, um the whatever uh that's what he was talking about yeah xdc yeah 
Who says they never did? I don't know what that is in reference to. So that's the downside of having chat be a little bit delayed is I don't know what that was in response to. Um, but yeah, measured the overhead. Um, we did a paper review for something that claimed to be low overhead and we measured the overhead and I think we made it like five times faster or something like that same stream. Uh, benefit of the doubt, that's the one that I was looking for, thank you. Um, and then we also did another review for a, um, a uh, like super compiling, fuck, what was it called? Uh, the zero, zero z z um, no, one, some, fuzz, one, uh, I forget what it was, but we did another paper where we basically like rewrote their code and made it more portable and faster in like five hours. Um, and they claimed it's like the fastest you can possibly get computers to run. And ultimately it's like the, the assembly they generated literally would emit a move instruction for every byte. They would not like join bytes and move words at a time. Like everything was a single byte. Everything was like the most inefficient assembly you could possibly generate. And like, you just gotta know better than that. <laughs> like, I'm, unfortunately like, I don't understand how you can generate assembly if you can generate assembly, I'm assuming you can read assembly. I can't imagine generating assembly and understanding that you're like templating out one byte at a time writes where like pretty much every time you do a traversal in a, in a uh, grammar, you end up doing like multiple function calls. Um, and you can claim that that's as fast as it can be. Like it just seems malicious to me because you can't, write code that generates assembly and be that oblivious to uh, assembly. F1 fuzzer, yeah. Um, and then we did another paper review on something else that claimed to have no overhead and then we measured it and it was really bad. Um, once again, these papers aren't bad. And this is why like not having code is nice because we'll go and, and rip apart code. Although this one, we probably wouldn't really read through the code because there's just, there's so much stuff here um, that I probably wouldn't even bother trying to get it set up because it would probably require reboots and configuration changes and a bunch of shit. So I wouldn't even bother uh, in, a, in a stream like this. So um, is it open source? It will be. It isn't right now, but it will be. So, but yeah. I think we're gonna wrap that up. I'm gonna uh, basically refill my water and then we will uh, get started on um, probably basically rewriting our Android exploit. Um, I think yesterday we learned that this uh, phone had multiple cores um, and we did not know that when we took our snapshots. So obviously if you have multiple cores, um, yeah, our snapshots were probably pretty fucked and that could have been why we were seeing some weird issues. I also want to make it so our exploit no longer crashes. So if you have not seen our exploit or any of the processes there and you want to get up to speed on basically everything from scratch, uh, that's probably what we're going to be doing today is basically writing this exploit from scratch. So I'm going to take a quick break and I will be right back.